Welcome into this special edition of the Dana Victory Podcast, only available on musketeerreport.com. I'm Rick, and in a minute you'll hear from my partner, Dan. This podcast is a collection of some of the greatest interviews from the DNV Podcast. The interviews are titled, so you can easily skip ahead. In this compilation, we'll hear from head coach Chris Mack, assistant coaches Travis Steele and Rick Carter, Xavier Insider and former voice of the Musketeers, Andy McWilliams, Enquire Xavier beat writer Shannon Russell, and local sports TV personality and Enquire preps writer Richard Skinner. Let's get right into it. This first guest basically legitimizes the entire podcast. We've had some pretty big interviews on here, but uh, he's as big as it gets. He's entering his fifth year as the head coach of the Musketeers with an overall record of 90 and 44 and two Sweet 16 appearances under his belt. It's my pleasure to welcome the head coach of the Xavier Musketeers, Coach Mack. Coach, we appreciate you taking some time out to join us here. Not a problem. Glad to be with you guys. All right. Well, Coach, obviously the biggest news in Xavier sports over the summer was the move to the Big East. I want to talk about that more in a minute. But first, I I want to talk about the second biggest news story, and that's the arrival of new athletic director Greg Christopher. I know it's only been a few months that you've been working with him, but you've been around him more than any of us have. What are your initial impressions of the new AD of Xavier Athletics? Well, I think, number one, he's an extremely hard worker. Uh, Greg is uh, really taking the time, I think, to evaluate um, you know, every facet of, of the athletic department and not necessarily come in and try to make a ton of changes, you know, right off the bat. I think he's really using this time um, just to see how things have been done uh, and maybe try to figure out over the course of the year maybe ways that he can improve, uh, you know, every program. Obviously, it's a big step up going to a new conference. Um, but Greg, like I said before, is, a, is an extremely hard worker. Uh, he's very detail-oriented. Uh, he's a guy that really wants to make sure that our facilities uh, are on par uh, with uh, the rest of our conference. Again, a huge step up. and He's, he's been incredibly supportive from day one. And, um, you know, I think he's going to be a huge asset to our, uh, to our program and to the athletic department as a whole. Hey, Coach, um, I remember at your initial press conference when you when you first got the job as, as Xavier head coach, you talked about the different roles that you had interacted with Xavier University as you talked about being a camper back at, back in the day, yeah. a recruit, uh, uh, opposing player, player, and then obviously an assistant coach. So for you, as you look back on, you know, really over 20 years of, of connection with Xavier University, how big is the move to the Big East? And what, what are the tangible differences you think fans, players, r- recruits are going to see as X moves into the Big East Conference this year? Well, I, number one, I think I, I don't just speak for myself, but I think I speak for the entire, um, you know, former players, uh, all the former players. Um, you know, it's, it's incredibly humbling. You know, I think a long time ago it was a pipe dream to sort of be in the same conference um, with the likes of a Georgetown and a Marquette. You know, I remember back when uh, Byron Larkin played and, and, uh, you know, some of the games that were on the schedule, um, you know, Huntington College and just uh, just a lot different. And and obviously what we've tackled in the non-conference part of the schedule over the last 10 years uh, has really upped the ante, has really uh, given Xavier more of a national name. But this conference... I think elevates uh, the program even further. And if we can, you know, do what we did in the Atlantic 10, which isn't easy, but uh, to be able to compete for Big East championships over the next five to 10 years, to put ourselves uh, in, in Madison Square Garden competing for a conference tournament championship, uh, it's gonna, it, it says a lot about our program. And again, it's going to be a huge step, but I'm very, very confident in the people that we have at Xavier, the players that we have in our program, Uh, and the assistance in terms of their work ethic and their ability to get the job done. Coach, there, there's a lot of excitement surrounding everything to, to do with this move, including Fox Sports 1 and all the money they're putting into the, being the flagship station of the Big East. As part of the deal with Big East, they're going to be having a Big East tip-off party broadcast on October 25th with a live look in at all 10 programs as they kind of have their own form of midnight madness there, despite the fact that it's at 9 p.m. Uh, from my point of view, this, this is the type of thing that sounds like awesome exposure for Xavier basketball and the Big East Conference as a whole. What are your thoughts about an event like this and are you guys kind of getting excited for for something like this to be coming up Uh, i mean it's 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 really exciting you know it does wonders for recruiting um you know to be shown in almost 100 million homes uh, just to practice just an introduction to your team again fox sports one is they're going to do their job 
they're really going to promote, you know, all the programs in the Big East. You know, we're the only conference that they're highlighting. Uh, virtually every game that we play in conference is going to be on Fox Sports 1. Uh, they're making a push, uh, and they're going to be a major player. And I think, I think the benefits uh, may not be, um, you know, this January, this February, but down the line as they continue to sort of hammer away and gain exposure for the member schools, um, it's, it's going to do wonders for our program. So, um, again, remember when we had Midnight Madness years ago in, in Schmidt Fieldhouse, and, you know, although we had a great turnout, the only people that really saw it were, those people, were the sweaty people in Schmidt Fieldhouse. Now to know that anybody across the country is going to be able to see, um, you know, our product, our university, our program, uh, it's a great thing and one we're looking really, really forward to. Hey, Coach, Rick and I wanted to maybe have you walk us through some of the newcomers on the team and two guys that were sort of, uh, unfortunately, for, for reasons really beyond their control, locked out of being part of the team last year were Miles Davis and Jalen Reynolds. Can you talk a little bit about how those two guys – dealt with that year of sort of being part of the program but not part of the program and, and how they yeah. and, and and your reflections on where they are as they move into what will be their freshman year from a basketball perspective? Yeah, I would say, number one, it was a very, very difficult year for them. Uh, probably the first year that they can remember in a long, long time since they were kids that they, w- they weren't able to play basketball competitively. You know, I'm sure they played in some open gyms. Uh, at different high schools and whatnot, and, you know, maybe at the O'Connor Sports Center and some intramurals, but uh, it's not the same when you when you're part of a team. Now, I will correct you a little bit, and uh, when you say factors beyond their control, you know, that's the one thing I think that you know kids out there have to understand that, you know, academically you have to get the job done, be able to play at the Division One level. Um, you know, it, it's challenging. You know, the responsibility of you know, making sure you handle your, your schoolwork is one that I think Miles and Jalen unfortunately learned the hard way. And uh, they did a great job as freshmen going to every class, uh, doing really well, putting themselves in a position of being eligible, not just being eligible, but achieving. Uh, but again, they had to learn the hard way. As far as being a player, I have tremendous confidence in both of them. You know, I know that their hunger is going to be at an all time high where anytime you go a year without something that you love, um, you know, you, you you cherish it. You know, you don't take it for granted. You know, what Miles brings to the table, I think, number one, he's very vocal. He knows what's going on in the basketball floor. He's got a high IQ for the game. He's certainly a high-level shooter, as I think a lot of people know and have heard about. But he's more than just a shooter. He's not going to sit in the corner and wait for penetration and only be able to shoot the ball. He can take you off the dribble. He can expose, you know, bad closeouts. He knows how to feed the post. Uh, I think he's a conscientious defender. I don't think he's a lockdown defender, but he cares. So uh, Miles is uh, is a big game type player. I think the bigger the moment, the more Miles uh, will step up to the challenge, and it's hard to find sometimes. As far as Jalen Reynolds goes, I I can tell you that I don't know if I've coached a better athlete. You know, he's got uh, a lot to learn between the ears between now and and the start of the season. Uh, You know, he's going to be a guy that, you know, fans are going to have to have a little patience with because, uh, you know, college is a different game. Game moves a lot faster. But I tell you, Jalen has some physical abilities and some tools that uh, you can't teach. You know, he can get the ball well above the the uh, the rim. You know, whether he's rebounding on the offensive end, the defensive end, he's a tremendous finisher. He's got touch with either hand, uh, not just in and around the basket, but you know, all the way out to the three point line. His tools are endless. And, uh, you know, we're, we're really looking forward to Jalen making a huge impact on our team this year. Hey, Coach, we've got to see some of the actual freshmen coming in this guy, the 2013 class this year in, in the summer league. But that really only scratches the surface when it comes to find out what type of player these guys are going to be. I know you're not exactly practicing yet or anything, but what have you seen from these young guys so far? Brandon Randolph, Kamal Richards, Remy, Remy Abel, obviously a transfer who, who you kind of already right. knew what he had coming in. But what has stuck out to you about these guys? Well, you know, I would tell you that, number one, Brandon Randolph is going to make an immediate impact on our program. You know, I, I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to come to a, a four, uh, four-man four workout and see that uh, he adjusts very quickly to this level. You know, the speed, the quickness of the game, the physicality needed. Brandon brings all those things to the table, and he's a very, very quick learner. Um, I have all the confidence in the world that he can be a lockdown defender. Maybe not so so much early because he's got to learn – all the different screening actions and the things that the teams do at this level. But in terms of ability, 
You know, he, he, he'll be up there with, with some of the, the better ones we've coached. Offensively, you know, he can shoot it, he can drive it, he's got a quick first step. He'll play both the one and the two. Uh, I'm really excited about Brandon's future. You know, Kamal is a little bit uh, a little bit behind Brandon. You know, Kamal is a guy that uh, is a physical small forward. He's left-handed. You know, he can shoot the ball out to the three-point line, but the speed of the game, uh, he has to he has to be caught up. And that's that's not different for a lot of freshmen. Uh, you know, that's that's something all freshmen struggle with. But uh, hopefully here during the preseason, you know, Kamal can sort of carve out a role and be a guy that eventually gets to, uh, to earn minutes on the floor. He's ultra competitive. You just have to understand that every drill we do, it's, uh, it's meaningful. It's, it's a competitive thing that, you know, we're asking you to bring the fire each and every drill, whether it's a two-on-two or two-on-o. It doesn't matter. And so he'll have to learn those things, but uh, I'm confident he will. Coach, when you look at your big men for the upcoming season, two of the guys that are going to play a critical role are Matt Stangbro, transfer from, from Western Michigan, and then and then Isaiah Fillmore, who seemed to be physically limited last year due to his knee injury, but, but started to come into his own toward the end of the season. Can you talk about what you expect from those two guys and, and the, the, the sort of progress people can expect to see with them as they, as they get bedded into this system over the course of the year? Sure. Sure. I would say, number one, the first thing we're going to ask of them is leadership. You know, both of them are in their senior year. Obviously, Matt in his true senior year and Isaiah as a fifth-year senior. Uh, but they're both smart basketball players. They both care an awful lot. Uh, they're excellent leaders. You know, they're, they're guys that set the right example for how to conduct themselves on and off the floor. And, um, you know, I really expect uh, leadership. It's obviously easy to be a leader when things are going well. But I think, in, you know, in signs of adversity, those guys are going to do a great job for us, number one. You know, Isaiah looks as uh, as good as he's ever had in a Xavier uh, practice jersey. You know, he's light. He's not uh, he's not overweight. He's, he came in really fit to start the fall, which is what we expected as a fifth-year senior. He is uh, – he's been great in the preseason. I'm really looking forward to Isaiah really continuing to uh, play in much the same way he ended the season a year ago. And then obviously a lot of been, lots been talked about uh, when it comes to Matt Stainbrook, who will play the five position for us. Matt's the biggest player on our team. You know, he's about 6'10 and a half, 6'11, 265, 270 pounds. I think he'll be a guy that uh, plays with a high IQ, really knows how to seal his man inside, very unselfish, good passer. And so Matt's going to be, uh, he's going to be a load for us. We're going we're to count on him to do an awful lot on both ends of the floor. Coach, uh, one other guy that we, we thought might be a part of this class that it, it turns out is not going to be with that, Alexander Vezenkov, obviously an international recruit. Things changed quickly there. It, w- it was a different situation, obviously not your typical uh, recruiting situation that, that you're used to. Could you just explain what happened there at the end and sort of what, what went on in the final days of his recruitment? Yeah, I don't know how long we have on the podcast, but you can imagine <laughs> the uh, the roller coaster of emotions and uh, – just the roller coaster of, uh, of events that sort of happened over the last uh, couple months with Alex. You know, we, we fully expected Alex to arrive on, in, on campus in the fall. And um, I went over to watch him in the under-19 European Championships, play, or under-18 European Championships. Played extremely well. Uh, his team was terrible, but Alex played really well and led the um, championships in scoring. And because of that, had a multitude of offers. And, you know, when you grow up in Europe, it's a different culture. You know, I think obviously Americans don't necessarily understand um, that, uh, you know, when, when you get out of high school or we get out of club ball, you really had that decision, you know, do you, do you hang up the game or do you turn professional if uh, obviously if you have the opportunities to do that. And so really felt like we had, we had a really good shot at Alex, but the, the offers that he got were just uh, for him and his family too hard to pass up. And Alex was extremely invested in Xavier. I know he felt extremely remorseful, but uh, obviously not enough to uh, to come and join us. But, you know, for us, it's just a speed bump in the road. You know, we uh, we lose guys all the time. Obviously, it's a little bit more highly publicized nowadays than it was 10, 15 years ago, but that's okay. We'll continue to, to look and hunt for guys that want to wear a Xavier uniform and represent us as, uh, as well as they can. Coach, you've been you've been great with your time. We really appreciate you coming on. Uh, what give us a little preview here of what what's coming up for you? I know th- rules have changed a little bit with the NCAA. When are you guys going to start practice exactly? Well, you know, this year we're sort of balancing recruiting. Um, you know, you're go- allowed to go out on the road September 9th, go visit kids, whether they're 
uh, seniors that you're that you're going to sign, whether it's freshmen that you're just trying to get a uh, a beat on that you've heard about. So any anywhere in between, and then we actually start practice six weeks before our first game. It, you know, Gardner Webb is our first game on Friday, November eighth. So you, you you rewind it six months, and that puts us at September twenty seventh. We'll actually begin practice September thirtieth because of those forty two days, you're only allowed to practice in thirty of them. So you have to sort of pick and choose, give guys more off days, and so that's what we chose to do. So for us, we'll have thirty of the next thirty nine days once September thirtieth rolls around to get this season started. He is the head coach of the Xavier Musketeers. Coach, we really appreciate your time. Thanks a lot. Well, thanks for having me. All right. Well, joining us now in the podcast, it's my pleasure to welcome in assistant coach Travis Steele. Coach, thanks for joining us on the Dana Victory podcast. No problem. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, coach, let's start right here. The big news coming out just recently that you guys are moving to the Big East Conference. First of all, take us through what was kind of the reaction in the, with the, among the coaching staff? And two, how has it changed recruiting for you so far this spring? You know, I think obviously very excited about the new opportunity and the new challenges that the Big East presents. Um, you know, it's as good of a conference as any conference in the entire country. Um, you know, we're very thankful for all the past players that played at Xavier and uh, previous coaches uh, that have made this, uh, you know, this dream a reality, I guess, for us. You know, we've taken Xavier's come a long way over the last 20 years of, you know, continue to take steps in the right direction of becoming a you know a top 15 program in the entire country and i think as far as recruiting goes rick like i think it's going to help us you know it just uh, you know kids won't be attracted to playing in the big east you know you're playing in madison square garden which is the uh, mecca of, college, of basketball in general in the entire world um, for our conference tournament we have the likes of georgetown um providence um, Bill and Nova all coming to the Centa Center, so I think it's going to be a big attraction. Hey, Coach, if you, if you can expand on the recruiting thing a little bit more, I've sort of likened it to the fact that, look, you guys recruited really well in the 810 because of your success in the tournament and because of the status of Xavier's basketball program. But there's still, it's one of those things where recruits, when they're kind of looking at schools, they almost have a checklist, and, and, and their parents may as well, where they're kind of, kind of looking for certain things. It's like, okay, yeah, Xavier has tournament success. Yes, they're on TV all the time, but they're playing in the Atlantic 10 in the past. Now it's sort of just one thing that they can't use against you when, when looking at your school. Is that somewhat correct, or do you agree with that at all? No, I definitely do. I think I think it uh, that stigma of, hey, you guys playing the Atlantic 10 is no longer there, obviously. You know, it's like we used to always tell recruits, we're not recruiting you to play in the Atlantic 10. We're recruiting you to pick, make it to the Final Four. And, you know, and that's still our, obviously our goal. Um, now we're even going to be on a bigger stage in the Big East, which obviously is very attractive to recruits and their families. Um, but at the end of the day, it comes down to fit. You know, it's got to be a right fit for us. It's got to be a right fit for the kid. But I do think it's going to help us kind of expand our recruiting even a little bit more. Coach, turning to next year's team, there's going to be a lot of roster turnover. You've got uh, Matt Stainbrook, um, Miles Davis, Jalen Reynolds, all are going to be – eligible and able to play for you this year um can you talk real briefly about the roles you anticipate those guys playing next season i'll start off with matt you know matt you know came to xavier obviously his first college game ever was in the centos center um when he played at western michigan and he played very well against us and you know we knew right then and there it's like man hey this kid's really skilled when he transferred um you know i had that memory our so did coach mack of matt Bainbrook's pretty dang good and you know when we took him i think a lot of people questioned it a little bit um but matt is a guy that works diligently. His work ethic is as good as anybody I've ever been around. You know, he's lost being near 60 pounds. Coach Matt Jennings, our strength coach, has done a great job with him. Um, and Matt's put all the work in. Um, you know, I think Matt's going to give us a guy on the offensive end, a guy that we can play through. He has a brilliant basketball IQ. Highest, the highest basketball IQ I've honestly I've ever been around as far as a player. Um, he sees things on the court. You know, I think we can throw him the ball in the low post and give him the ball to a score or make a play for others. He's going to command a lot of attention down there. I also think that he's going to be able, we're going to be able to use him in the high post on offense. 
because uh, he can really, really pass, and he can shoot the ball 15 to 17 foot, even though he thinks sometimes he can shoot some threes. <laughs> <laughs> but he uh, he's going to bring a lot of skill to us on the offensive end and the guy that can really play. Um, Jalen Reynolds, you know, Jalen is a uh, highly athletic kid, um, very long, tough, nasty around the rim. Um got a chance to be really, really good. Um, and he's gotten a lot stronger. I know that. You can look at his body, and it looks like he's a senior. You know, his body does. Um, again, Coach Mike Jennings deserves a lot of credit on that. Um, he's worked really hard with him and uh, given him kind of just a plan, even though he wasn't really able to lift with him, just kind of gave him a plan to do. Um, so, you know, I just pick him having a big role, rebounding, finishing, you know, blocking shots, you know, being a great finisher because um, we're going to have very good guard play. Um, then you go to Miles Davis, and I say Miles, obviously, you know, his reputation is a big time shooter. And I think Miles is even more than that, though. I think he's more of a scorer. You know, I think Miles can re- really knows how to play, uh, can shoot, handle, and pass. You know, I always say, people always say, hey, this kid's a really skilled kid. A lot of kids can only just shoot the ball, or they can only handle, or they can only pass. He can do all three. And I think that makes him a little bit unique on our team because we really need that skill set on the perimeter. We need a guy who can really score the ball, and Miles is going to bring that. Coach, Matt Stainbrook had a little bit of a setback here uh, before the spring with a knee injury. I know he had to have surgery. Where is he at in terms of his recovery, and how well has he been able to stay, you know, keep the weight off and stay conditioned? Okay, I'm not really allowed to maybe comment on his injury per se, but know that he's doing doing very, very well. He'll be back any day. Um, you know, Matt, I would say, has done a great job. Honestly, he's lost weight um, even during this process. So he's doing great. Travis, talking about the guys that you've got coming back next year, I mean, Samaje, obviously, I don't think there's a whole lot needs to be said about his game. But who are the other returnees um, do you see as – particularly critical to your success next year i mean is I, I think the easy the easy answer for fans is to say well justin martin because he's the incumbent at the three but who are some guys that you're looking for to make to make a significant step forward this season you know i really hope we'll start kind of with the guards i really hope d davis makes a big jump you know d had a d had a pretty good year as a sophomore especially a guy that didn't play a whole lot as a freshman um, played spot minutes. You know, I thought he did a nice job for us. He, I thought overall he was our, probably our best defender last year. Um, he did a great job for us. But the areas where he's really got to improve in is decision making. You know, his assist to turnover ratio uh, can't be hovering around the one to one. You know, can't be. That's not good enough in order for us to win the Big East. You know, his assist to turnover ratio has to be two to one. I mean, he has need to have for every one turn, turnover he has, you have to have two assists and. He's really got to be able to run our team, be more vocal, and make sure that our offense and our defensive system is being executed at the highest level. Um, Looking for him to take that jump in leadership, looking for him to take that jump in decision-making. Justin Martin, he'll be critical. You know, I I think it all comes down to his effort level and his focus. You know, I I think Justin um, has to be able to handle a little adversity, whether it's getting an early foul getting two early fouls in a game where he gets to sit the rest of the half um, or, you know, something bad happened in a game. He missed a couple shots early. He's got to be able to get past adversity. He's got to be mentally tougher. Um, and I'll say he's had a very good off season. Um, looking for him, forward to him even becoming mentally tougher this during the summer. Um, that's going to be a big step for him. Um, then you kind of go on to uh, trying to think, you know, Eric Stanger. Obviously, you know, I, I think Eric can bring even more than what he brought as far as a guy that can finish better around the rim, a guy that can make more free throws. And I think he will. You know, Eric is a diligent worker. He's going to put time in the, in, in the gym in the off season, and he's going to get better at those two areas. But, as you know, we love to have Eric. Eric does a great job out there on the floor. Um, and James Farr. James is expecting you to learn our system. You know, sometimes it's really difficult for a freshman coming in, and all of a sudden, you got an offensive and defensive system, and you're held accountable to it. 
a lot of times in high school. Um, not a held, you're not held accountable to the system executing little things. And it can be difficult for some guys more than others, depending upon the coaching that they've had and depending upon their basketball IQ. And James was one of those guys that struggled, had a little bit of a learning curve um, coming into last year with our system. And I think hopefully now that he knows our system for one full year, hopefully he can take that next step and execute it and execute it at game speed without thinking. And that's going to be the key for James Fox. I think James can shoot the ball. He rebounds the ball. He's obviously huge. He's a big human being. And he can block some shots. And I think he can have an impact on our team. Hey, Travis, real quick. Uh, I Guys that you have already signed, I believe you're allowed to comment on. Brandon Randolph, Kamal Richards, what type of high school seasons do those guys have? And, and I know you haven't had any chance to work with them or anything like that, but it, but what do you expect them to bring to the team? You know, I, I would I would expect to uh, start with Kamal. Kamal, you know, I would say had a good high school season. You know, he talked to all those guys up in the New England Prep School League, which our whole staff has very good relationships with. And they said, hey, Kamal's going to be able to help you guys out a lot. You know, Kamal, the three men, you know, he's about 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, very long. I would say longer than he is athletic. High motor, tough kid, plays hard, um, can shoot the ball. You know, I think he finds ways to score. Um, he rebounds the ball. I think fans and, and, and our staff are going to really love having him around. He's a great kid. Um, we expect big things out of him as a freshman. Um, Brandon Randolph, um, obviously from Inglewood, California, um, had a very good high school season. Um, got banged up a little bit at the very end of the season, but nothing serious at all. Um, but he had a great season. He's very explosive, very athletic. He's going to give us another guy who can play the one or the two. And, you know, he can score the ball and get by guys. I always say, like, when you evaluate players, can he get by his position? And Brandon can definitely do that. He's explosive. He's strong. You know, the biggest adjustment for him, I think, is going to be, again, like that day in, day out being pushed. You know, it's a little bit different than high school. The advantage Kamal's going to have is, is he was at a prep school fifth year, which will help. You know, he's going to be a little bit more mature, probably a little bit extra coaching than what Brandon's had. But Brandon, I think, could really come in and help us because we needed another ball hand. There was times last year when we get hurt, we have a couple guys go down. If get, like, for example, against UC or VCU, um, it really hurt us when D and Samaje or, or D specifically got hurt. And we didn't have anybody else to handle the ball. And I really think Brandon's going to be able to help us in that area. Coach, talking about the guys that you've signed for next year really brings us into a discussion of recruiting. And, and while we know we you can't really comment directly on uh, on uh, ongoing recruitments, you can talk about sort of the process. Um, yeah. Your, your background, I think, is interesting because you're a guy that got into coaching very young. I mean, you could probably say it's in your blood given that you, you know – Given that the coach at Illinois is a is a relative of yours, but um, but I, how do you think? Can, can you talk a little bit about your background and how you got into coaching at, at such an early at such an early age, and, and talk briefly about sort of the experiences that you bring to bear as a recruiter? Yeah, you know, I, I think you know I loved basketball when I was young. My brother, um, you mentioned, I claim him sometimes. <laughs> good thing is we have last names. Good thing is we have last names. They're the same moms, but different dads. Um, you know, he used to really push me, and uh, he'd work me out all the time. I had a guy named Todd Licklider, who was our high school coach. He was then the head coach at Butler and the head coach at, uh, at Iowa, and uh, phenomenal coach. So I was lucky and very fortunate enough to have, you know, two future, you know, Big Ten coaches and, and Todd Licklider and, and John Gross. To work me out to always be around me and uh, to work very fortunate to have that and that really impacted my uh, my life you know I love basketball I always grew up around it I was always playing um, I was never a great player um, but I but I, I always figured like I knew I wanted to coach and what I decided to do after my freshman year at Butler I decided to say you know what I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna this coach and see where it takes me. I started coaching high school basketball in Indianapolis at Ben Davis High School, and then I kind of I started up my own business of working out players. And I was fortunate enough to have some of the best players in Indiana all work out with me, and in, uh, in my workout facility. And I also coached AAU basketball with Spies. Um, again, had great teams and great players, lucky to be around them. And then I also coached with Indiana Elite. So I've kind of seen recruiting from probably a different angle than most college coaches. You know, I've, I've coached at the high school level 
I've coached in the AAU level and I've coached in the junior college level for, for a brief stint to where we've, you know, you got to recruit from all three of those levels. And here in the Midwest, you know, I would say that because I was one of them, you know, I, it's a little bit different. I got a different relationship with a lot of the high school coaches, AAU coaches and junior college coaches in, in the Midwest. Um, it's really taught me what do those guys are thinking on the other end. I think you always got to put yourself in their shoes because I think so many times college coaches like kids will hear the same spiel every night from a different coach and just kind of becomes the same. It it all gets mushed together. And I think you have to be different than the next coach that calls. Um, That's a big thing. You got to develop that relationship and that trust. Um, And that's really critical in recruiting. Coach, can you talk a little bit about just the process overall of recruiting when you're going out on the road and you know the last two weekends you you guys were allowed to get out there with your background and with your sort of unique look on recruiting what types of things are you out there looking for in a player in other words what traits or or what specific things that may be a little bit different from the way maybe us media guys rank players or look at players that you're really evaluating when you go out to these AAU tournaments sure I'd say the first thing you always got to find out man is other than just the basketball characteristics we'll talk about in a second, I think number one's character. I always say high character kids develop, you know, like because they're not as distracted by all the uh, stuff going on around them. They're, they're more, they're more focused, you know. So character is the first thing. You know, the second thing is, are they academically capable? And and uh, you know, we find that out by getting a transcript and seeing what their SAT, ACT scores are and whatnot. You know, but as far as the basketball stuff goes. I'd say first and foremost, the question you got to ask, and it's probably the hardest thing to find out about a kid, because every high school coach thinks their kid's a gym rat. <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> but it's all relative. <laughs> you know, it's all relative, though. You know, just because Johnny gets up 100 shots, you know, you know, twice a week, that doesn't mean he's a gym rat. You know, like the guys that love it, the guys that live it, breathe it, those are the guys that do well in college. And that's hard to figure out telling and recruiting but it's the most important thing to find out you know so but when I watch a kid just in general I'm watching uh, number one I want to know what his motor is you know does he play hard does he have a motor you know does he does he have energy level to him because I always say either a kid's either enhancing the energy of your team or he's hurting it it's one of the two it's you're never just even you know does he talk does he have intangibles? Is he a leader? Is he coachable? Is he a good teammate? You know, we look for all those things. And then the obvious things are, okay, can he shoot, handle, and pass? What skilled guys, guys that know how to play. I think I think so many times, um, I think as us coaches, we get caught up in size and our athleticism. Those things help. But you got to be able to, you got to have an IQ. If you don't know how to play, it's going to be hard. It's just going to be, especially at this level where the accountability offensively and defensively is a lot different than high school or AAU. Do they know how to play? Can they see things on the court offensively and defensively? Do they make winning plays? Um, you know, we want guys that win. There's a reason why certain guys win. And, and an average person may say, all right, man, he's not as good as him. He's not quite as talented. He may not be quite as talented, but he may be tougher. He may make more winning plays. He may be a better teammate, maybe more coachable. Um, there's a lot of different things that we look for um, when we say, hey, that's a Xavier player. Um, at the end of the day, though, those, those are all the things, you know, kind of we look for all of them, you know, if we possibly can. Coach, um, again, going back to the process, I think one of the things that is tough to, to get from the, because I'm not in the, I'm not in the business. I mean, I'm, I'm just a, basically just a just a fan a total outsider but a damn good podcast (laughs) co-host i I do my best um one of the things how do you and coach mack and coach howard and coach pegues assemble your list of who you're going to go out and target i mean i assume you guys have a big board somewhere in the bowels of Sintas center but Mm -hmm. how do you how do you focus in on who your top prospects are going to be how do you identify the guys that you that you feel like fit that mold of xavier player that you just talked about and decide how to you know allocate the resources that you have to try and get those guys in the fold 
You know, I think I think first off is getting the information, like, okay, I hear Johnny from, from wherever is really good. All right. Well, then I'm going to call his coach, high school coach or AAU coach. I call them both. Find out what they think of him and find out what his grades are like. Find out what his character is like. Then I'll go watch him. You know, we're allowed to go out during the season. There's a hundred, you know, during the school year, I guess, there's 130 countable days to where our whole staff, all four of us can go out and recruit. And so we get 130 days amongst all four of us. You know, we try to go out and evaluate all different classes, seniors, juniors, sophomores, freshmen. You know, we're always trying to, to identify young guys and get them onto campus as soon as possible. But I think through word of mouth, I think through the Internet, through Twitter, there's going to be less and less diamonds in the rough. There just are. Now, there's still going to be a few out there, and that's our job to find them. And, but, like, through word of mouth and our relationships, you know, Coach Begis is from Washington, D.C. He won't know about kids from that area. Coach Howard is from Philadelphia. He's going to know about kids from that area and Jersey and all, and other people that they know in the business. And same thing with me being from Indiana and being a recruiting here in the Midwest. I'll, I'll hear about kids. And that's kind of how we get out. We see those kids. We identify them. If we like them. We'll get them to campus, try to get them to campus as early as possible for an unofficial visit um, just so they can see us develop, start developing that relationship. Again, that's what it always comes down to is like, do they trust you? Do you trust them? You know, and I think it goes both ways, and we got to really figure that out. But you know, that's kind of in a gist how we find out about them more through word of mouth and, and through our relationships in the business. It, Trev, real quick, just sort of wrapping up this re- recruiting conversation. It's been completely enlightening, I'm sure, for, for me and, and and many of our listeners as well. But w- when you're talking about you know that that relationship is that the most important important thing to build with these recruits because when we interview these kids you know they're always talking about well I, I, most important thing to me is style of play or most important thing to me is i want to go to a big school or i want to go to a big conference or i want to like the coaching staff is it something different for every kid or what is the most important thing in your opinion to sell a kid on you know i, th- I think the always the first question i ask a recruit the two first questions are what are you looking for in a school? And then who's helping you make the decision? You got to know those two things. And you got to know, like, who around that kid, around the kid is an information guy? Who's the guy that you need to really push? And we try to basically surround the recruit as best as we possibly can with phone calls, text messages, emails, as long as we can, you know, as long as, those allow, as, long as he's old enough um, in the process. And I think, like, when you ask a kid, what is he looking for? School is different for every kid. Some families, you know, the families that we want, the kids that we have success with, Xavier, very high value education very highly. And, and that's big for us. That means we could probably have a really good shot at them. Um, you know, but, like, some kids, are, they're more interested in style of play. Some kids are more interested in, you know, development. Some kids are more interested in facilities. But I think at the end of the day, that kid and their family has to trust you because when they send their son away to college, to wherever it is, wherever they're from, they got to say to themselves, like, we trust them with our son. That's a big responsibility. You're almost like a parent to them for the next four years. You're basically the parents of their kid, and they really got to be able to trust them. I think the kid, the recruit, has to really be able to trust the coaches that you're not selling them just a bag of goods and you're telling them the truth. Um, because all of a sudden, if you start lying to them on the recruiting end, and then they get to your to your campus, things change. All of a sudden, they don't trust you. And all of a sudden, it's going to be a little bit harder to coach them. And that, that trust starts in the recruiting process. The honesty and, and and being very upfront in the recruiting process of exactly how it's going to be here um, at Xavier, I think is really big in, in developing the trust um, within the uh, with the group and his family. Coach, one question that I think Rick and I were both talking about before we had you on here, and could you walk us through just a uh, like a recruitment of a guy that's maybe on the team now or is or is left that that you were involved in? I know you were the primary guy on Samaje Kristen and D Davis, and just maybe tell us a little bit about how you got to know the kid and 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 how the uh, how you became aware of them and and what steps you took to get them on campus. You know, you think that with D. You know, I was at Indiana University before I came to Xavier. And 
Odyssey Beach from Bloomington right there, where Indi- that's where Indiana University is located at. You know, so I've known D forever, and since he was a little guy, and uh, you know, I've known his dad. Um, you know, he, you know, a player that I used to uh, work out and I recruited in Indiana, Armand Bassett, was really close with with Dar- D Davis. And, uh, you know, he used to work out with him all the time. And, and Armand told me, hey, Coach Steele, you need to be on him hard. Got him over to campus. We liked what we saw. Committed. You know, again, like I, that trust had been there for a long time between me and his family. Um, and you kind of go to Samaje Christian. You know, Samaje was a, uh, a guy, a late bloomer, um, so to speak. Um, you know, Samaje lives 20 minutes from Xavier's campus. Um, you know, he had a great senior year at Wynn Woods. You know, went up and watched him practice. Loved him. Um, and uh, Coach Max saw him play a few times. Loved him. You know, it just kind of that was like, that was the position that we really needed. We knew it was a great fit for us. And I think if if you interviewed Samaje, he would tell you that the big things, you know, attractions to Xavier were number one, education. Mom, you know, his mother is a great lady. Loved education here, Xavier. Loved it. And being close to his family, Samaj is a very, very family-oriented guy. Um, you know, he loved being around his brothers and sisters and mom. Um, you know, that was a big thing. And then just the style of play and development. And I, he, you know, I think he knew that, you know, to work, to get to where he wants to go one day, he knew he could reach those dreams here at Xavier and wanted to do it in his city and uh, represent the city of Cincinnati for the best he can. Assistant coach Travis Steele. Travis, you've been more than generous with your time, but you know, you got we gotta be honest, when we can get a big time guest like you and not talk to Brian Snow on this podcast, it's always a good night. We we gotta milk it for all it's worth. We appreciate you joining us. <laughs> Thank God Brian Snow wasn't on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Travis Steele, thanks for joining us, coach. Thank you. Let's get to this interview with Andy Mack because I'm fired up about it. I hope you guys enjoy it. And, Dan, there's only one way to bring this man in. Brown against Burton. Brown starting his dribble. He moves in. He pops up. He shoots. Scores! Lenny Brown! Xavier wins it! The Muskies win it! 71-69! And this the UC Bearcats are number one in the country, number two in their own city. 71-69. Lenny Brown on a dribble drive from the left wing. Buried it inside the free throw line. Muskies win it, 71-69 over UC. Incredible. Number one goes down on their own floor. It's my pleasure to welcome in the former voice of the Xavier Musketeers and featured columnist on Musketeer Madness, Andy McWilliams. Andy Mack, how are you doing? I'm doing well. The Muskies are 3-0 and and uh, headed west and all's right with the world. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> well, we, before we get into those beloved Musketeers of yours, uh, let's talk a little bit about what you're up to these days. Just for those who haven't gotten a chance to catch up with you, what are you up to these days? Well, I've been in financial services uh, basically since I got out of the radio business, and uh, I worked for a company uh, uh, called Morgan Stanley. It used to be Smith Parney, now it's Morgan Stanley. I'm a financial advisor, but my real job is uh, writing my uh, certainly my much anticipated and authoritative uh, column or whatever it is on Musketeer Madness. <laughs> <laughs> no question. An esteemed columnist yeah. over at Musketeer Madness, and we enjoy reading about that. But you've kept up. I mean, you, you are an encyclopedia of Xavier basketball knowledge, so it's always great to get your take on uh, on the Musketeers. And let's just start right there with your overall impressions of this team to this point. Expectations were down coming into the year. Um, where were your expectations coming into the season? Where are they now? And what have you liked or disliked about this team so far? Uh, certainly, uh, I had a lot of questions about uh, how this season was going to evolve, but uh, so many of the pundits, uh, both local and national, were basically dismissing Xavier as, you know, this is going to be a down year, this team is going to be horrible, this is going to be a huge step back, uh, you know, they, they're, they're going to struggle to uh, play 500 basketball, they may not win 10 games, they're, you know, they predicted anywhere from 
to uh, uh, 10th or 11th or 12th in the Atlantic 10, and I, I don't know. I mean, you know, it, it, it's sort of like uh, the negatives were being extrapolated from uh, here to uh, Passaic, New Jersey. It got a little bit ridiculous. And, you know, there were certainly a bunch of negatives during the off season, and primarily the Des Wells deal, which uh, I still don't understand how he was uh, expelled. And I've read all the materials. And I mean, you know, uh, maybe there's something that I'm missing here, but I thought that was uh, an unforced error on, on Xavier to lose a player of that ilk based on what he did or, or didn't do. But that, that was the main negative. I mean, personally, I thought the, the Mark Lyons deal, uh, it doesn't matter what the context is, uh, it was addition by subtraction. Not that Mark was a bad kid or, uh, you know, a, a hood or a thug or whatever, because he isn't. But, you know, he, he'd spent four years, a lot of water had gone under the bridge, and uh, I think it was just maybe the right time for Mark to move on and the circumstances worked out that you know Xavier helped him get his degree and uh, they played and Sean Miller was desperate for a uh, point guard out there at Arizona and uh, hopefully it'll work out well for both parties because I mean if I'm Chris Mack I do not want my fifth year uh, pseudo point guard to be my number one headache going into the season and that very possibly could have been the way it was so uh, with D Davis and uh, and some Ajay Kriston available to to run the point. Uh, looking at their at their abilities, I'd say Lions would have been my third choice to run the offense. And and uh, you know he he wants to showcase uh, his abilities. God bless him to play in Europe or the NBA or whatever. And uh, he may have that uh, high profile opportunity with Arizona. I hope it works out because I, I I like Mark. I like uh, Sean Miller. I, I hope uh, it's one of those deals. It's a win win. No question. Well, you look at you talk about all those negatives coming into the season. Now, a few games in, you've had a chance to see this team. Where are you at now with this team? I mean, where are your expectations now? How good can this team be? And uh, I've been pretty impressed personally with the coaching job so far. I'm just a little surprised that this team is as far along as they are already with all of the inexperience, new parts trying to come together, plus the implementation implementation of a new offense. Where are you at with this team right now? Well, the other day before the Butler game, I was sitting in the press room over at the at Xavier, uh, downing uh, probably a you know a, a more than I needed of Cincinnati barbecue, and I was sitting next to Paul Doherty, who who, uh, who I respect. But the Doc asked me, "said Do you do you expect this t- team to win ten games this year?" And I said, "Yeah, yeah, Doc, I do. I think they'll win ten games in the league." And I, and I you know I, I I stick with that. I think this. This team has. Uh, uh, they're going to be a lot of ups and downs. They're going to, you know, uh, the Butler win was a huge win. Uh, I think uh, in terms of, uh, you know, it's it's incredible. Well, Butler just knocked off uh, uh, Marquette in the first round of the Maui Classic, and that, that's a great win for Butler. And it just uh, underscores the, uh, you know, the the magnitude of the win for Xavier over Butler. Um, but they're going to be a lot of ups and downs with the downs with this team certainly the, the lack of depth is uh, is uh, going to be a problem area on the road in the league on the road uh, non-conference at places like Purdue uh, with uh, even with Isaiah Fillmore available they're only you know they're, they're really you know especially at, at the guard they're they're pretty uh, pretty thin D Davis is going to get into some foul trouble so is Samaje the way they if they're going to pressure pressure the ball defensively and and they're going to get some bad road whistles in the league and and at places like uh, Purdue and Wake Forest uh, you know it, it's it's definitely a problem but uh, you know on balance I think this team has a chance to uh, win 10 11 12 games in the league and uh, you know maybe you know be one of those four or five or six teams that uh, have a shot at a, an NCAA at large bid I mean it's a, it's a long way to go they got to avoid uh, catastrophic Injuries because they don't have any uh, uh, margin 
room for error there. But, uh, you know, I like the way this team plays together. I like the way they share the ball. And, uh, you know, D. Davis has made uh, a quantum leap. I mean, he we knew that he was a had a, had a great uh, pedigree and a great skill set, but he has improved uh, dramatically. And we haven't even seen the tip of the iceberg with uh, Samaje Kriston. I mean, that guy uh, can get to the basket against almost anybody. And he, there's a guy who's a, he's a, uh, you know, now, you know, they've, they've changed all the ratings. Now he's a five star guy. You know, a year ago he was a three star guy and, you know, he they, they wasn't even on the radar screen. Right. Here's a guy, here's a guy who, uh, like the game against Butler, he's playing with a bad elbow. He can barely shoot the ball, but he eats up 27 minutes, has eight assists, and, <clears throat> and, the, and the national guys look at his line, well, disappointing outing for uh, Samaje Kriston, only two points. You know, he did exactly what they needed to win the ball game. Yeah, he, he only Here's, took two he, shots. <laughs> he only took two shots because he couldn't, he couldn't hoist the jump shot. Right. You know, and, and, but there's a guy who played within, he's smart enough to listen to the coaches and realize what his role was. I mean, he could easily have not played in that game, uh, but he did, and he, he knew what his role was. And, you know, a lot of the big ego uh, McDonald's All-Americans would go, hey, this is my first TV game. I'm on ESPN. Uh, I've got to prove that I am a five-star recruit. i got to jack my 14 or 15 shots, and he didn't do that. He played within the team concept, which I thought for, you know, uh, for a, a young guy like that shows a lot of maturity. I think this this team has the ability to execute a game plan. Uh, and and you're right about the coaching. I mean, anybody who ever has questioned Chris Mack's coaching ability, look what he did two years ago with uh, basically a seven-man roster. Yep. And he had no guard depth. The three guards, basically uh, Dante Jackson was a guard. He, he, he started at, at small forward, or, you know, they played a three-guard set or whatever you want to talk. But Lions and, and, and Holloway and, uh, and uh, Dante Jackson played basically every minute. The only guys off the bench, as I remember, were uh, uh, Jeff Robinson and Andrew Taylor, who both you know, did well, and and they used the uh, one of the walk-ons, uh, Kevin uh, Feeney, to, to, Feeney yeah. to to eat up some. He did a good job because he knew he knew where he had to be, and he was a good relay man in the offense. But uh, you know, that was basically a seven-man team. They w- went fifteen and one in the league, and uh, and made the NCAA tournament. So, yeah. I mean, Mac, Mac is. Uh, I think his first three teams have all been nine and five, nine and five, nine and five, nine and five. They've all gotten better. Uh, through various ups and downs, but they've all played their best basketball uh, in the month of March, except two years ago. I mean, they did hit the wall, I think. Uh, and then, you know, they had a really bad first-round matchup against Marquette. That was that was a really bad matchup. I think that team, with any luck, had legs to win a game or two. But I they, agree. They got a, got a really bad matchup against Marquette. Yeah, and so much of it is matchups, and that team just drew a bad one. You know, I want to go back to something you were talking a little bit about um, the way that Chris Mack has has handled his teams and, and the way that they've gotten better as the season goes on. And you look at this team, it, and uh, I want to get your opinion. To me, this team seems to, you, you mentioned it earlier, execute a game plan, I guess, is the words I'm looking for, better than maybe some of these other teams, especially early on. I mean, when you look at what they did in that Butler game, the discipline and just the understanding of you have to go to over top and fight through every single screen, and if you don't, they will hit a three, was, I mean, nearly flawless on the defensive end. Xavier fought through every screen, didn't allow an open three the whole game, and really kept Butler's guards in check, and, and those two guys can, can light it up as we saw today if you let them get any type of space. Yeah, they uh, they basically I thought they out butlered Butler because uh, Butler is a you know Brad Stevens is a stickler for attention to detail for game plan. I mean his his teams get better and better as the season goes along. But he had you know he had more uh, bullets and more veteran bullets in that game against you know in game two of the season than than Xavier did. And uh, you know I thought that uh, that was uh, uh, as you say they did a great job of. Uh, of staying focused to the game plan because you give that guy Rodney Clark or Dunham, either one of those guys, you give them an inch and it's it's in the basket. Those guys are dead eye, you know. We're, those are uh, you know top top of the list shooters, both of those guys. 
and uh, Xavier really frustrated them. And you know, Stevens, that's his game. Attention to detail, and, and Xavier just and then and Xavier out toughed them. They got the they got the, a lot more fifty fifty balls, and uh, you know I think Mac out coached. Uh, you know Stevens was, you know, went deep on his bench, especially in the second half. He played a lot smaller lineup than he probably wanted to because he was trying to spread the floor and shake somebody open for for open looks. And, and luckily it was you know Eric Fromm and Aldridge and some of those guys who are a good player and, and Stigal, they're good players, but you'd rather have them shoot the three than uh, than Dunham or you know Rodney Clark. I mean they're gonna they're gonna get some open looks. The the way they move the ball, you want you want those uh, third, fourth, fifth options. The guys triggering the shots and not the not the one and two options. But uh, yeah, I thought that uh, you know, and that, that and, and because uh, Stevens played a smaller lineup, that gave Mac the the latitude to play Redford, Davis, and Samaje at the same time, and they were on yeah, the floor a point. lot in the second half, and, and it also allowed uh, Travis. Taylor to dominate the defensive board because Butler was uh, basically living by the jump shot, and it was one and none when they put the ball up. And uh, that's you know that that again. I mean that took a guy like Kyle Marshall uh, and Roosevelt Jones took them right out of the ball game. And and that's and, and watching the warm up, they they have really good big guys, and they're gonna by the end of the year they're gonna be killer yep. inside. They got depth. They got athletic. I think uh, Cameron Woods. Uh, Cameron Woods. Yep. It, 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 the light's going to go on with that guy someday, uh, pretty soon, and he's going to be. Uh, I mean, he's going to be a, 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 like a, a one of the one of the St. Joe's guys. I mean, Aiken or is it yeah, CJ Aiken or uh, Roberts inside? He's as, he's as good as those guys. Yeah, no no doubt. Both both him and Kyle Marshall. I agree. They were basically taken out of the game plan because of the way Butler had to play offensively and and. And as a result, it took two of the guys who could have maybe changed that game in Butler's favor and completely negated them. I wanted to get your take real quick on, uh, you mentioned him a little bit, Samaj A. Kristen and the immense talent that he has. I'd love to get your historical perspective on this. Where does he rank on the list of freshmen you've seen at Xavier? And I don't think there, there's nobody that I can remember you can compare him to in terms of an overall skill set. I'm not saying that he's going to be the best guard ever to play at Xavier. That's far, far from uh, a done deal. Because, you know, I mean, he's had sort of a, you know, on balance, he's had sort of a rough uh, uh, baptismal in into Division One. I. I mean, he didn't, uh, he didn't play in the opener because of the, the, the elbow injury. Then in the Butler game, he, you know, he got uh, bounced around a lot. Still played 27 minutes, and then in the uh, uh, the Robert Morris game, he, I guess he, he tweaked the elbow, and then he, he's had cramping problems too. I mean, they've got to they've got to address that because he he's got to be able to, you know, uh, I mean, he's gonna uh, he's gonna have to play 30 30 plus minutes if they're gonna be uh, the team that the, the that they're capable of being. He's got to be on the floor, but you know. Long arms, ability to get to the basket, uh, uh, unselfishness. Uh, I mean, Xavier really hasn't had a whole lot of long guards like that. <clears throat> he reminds me athletically a bit of Romain Sato, but uh, you know, Sato had it, it, maybe his weakest skill was putting the ball on the floor. Right. I mean, exactly. I mean, he'd be in the NBA right now. You know, the San Antonio Spurs. He'd be you know playing his like his ninth year with the San Antonio Spurs if he could uh, uh, could have executed the dribble drive and uh you know i mean as it is he could probably probably could have come back to the nba two or three or four years ago and gotten a really good deal that he's making so much money in europe that uh, and he's comfortable over there that he why you know why bother but uh i mean he's the high one of the highest paid players in europe he, he's signed a big deal in turkey that's where all the money is right now in europe, <laughs> turkey uh, and and the russian and the russian league because of all the oil money over there but is there any uh, is there any money in there covering those games, Andy Mack? Maybe you and I can go over and start a little new play by play tandem up over there. And the problem is we don't uh, speak Russian fluently. <laughs> I mean, I, I do, I do, I can read Russian, and uh, but no, <laughs> I'd have no, 
<laughs> I'd have no clue over there. But you know, I'm, I've been thinking. I I can't think of you know. Ralph Lee was long, but he wasn't anywhere near as quick as as Samaje. Um, and he's uh, God, he's got a great skill set. I mean, you know, the barring catastrophic injury, he he should uh, he should progress, and he will under under Chris Mack. He will get better and better. Uh, he should play at some point in the NBA. I mean, yeah, I don't he reminds he, he reminds me of some of those great Temple guards, uh, uh, Mark Make and Ricky Brunson, uh, um, you know, Christmas. All those guys. I mean, long, lanky, uh, can get into the passing lanes. Just uh, you know, like a really slippery, sticky defender, but a, a guy who's not going to hunt his shot. You know, like uh, uh, you know, uh, for get a, getting his getting a shot away is not his number one priority in life. A lot of these, a lot of these guys today, these AAU guys. That's all I think about. My scoring line. How can I score? How am I going to look? Uh, I think Samaje is really uh, far ahead in that he, you know, he's a team guy and uh, he, he he really knows how to pass the ball. Yeah, well, when you when you look at his career and the way he sort of skyrocketed on the scene, I mean, you mentioned he was just a three star, you know, before before now they've made him a five star going back after he did prep school. But you look back even just his junior year of high school, and he was just a role player that averaged like ten assists on a team of a bunch of upperclassmen who could really score, and. You know, you, you you look at that, and he wasn't even on anyone's radar. And all of a sudden, senior year, all those upperclassmen leave, and he becomes kind of the go-to guy. And people start realizing that wow, he has elite speed, and he can really put, deck it, and he can get to the rim and score. So he starts blowing up. Xavier starts recruiting him among other schools, and then it just continues to to escalate as the, as the spring and summer went on in AAU, and he continued to get better. But you're right. I mean, he started out as a pass first point guard, and he's really carried that with him into the college ranks. Uh, you, Looking back, Andy Mack, at your career calling Xavier games, I think everyone remembers the number one in the country, number two in their own city shootout game. But what is your favorite call or game or memory that you have of, of calling Xavier basketball? You know, uh, I, we just uh, celebrated the uh, 25th anniversary of the 1987 Xavier team, and uh, that win over Missouri over at the Hoosier Dome was uh, that was a watershed uh, win for the program. It was their first NCAA victory, and you know nobody gave them much of a chance against uh, Missouri. Like Pete Gillen used to say, Missouri when they came out of the floor, they had like they were like Noah's Ark. They had two of everything. They had two seven footers. They had, had an NBA guy and Derek Chivas, and you know, that was that was a great win uh, in '87 uh, at the Hoosier Dome. Uh, I think the, the 1990 win in the second round over at the, the Hoosier Dome again against uh, uh, Georgetown. I mean, Georgetown was the beast of the East, and they had uh, Matumbo and Morning. Yeah, and uh, that, that was a, that was a great great uh, uh, win there, and uh, you know their first Sweet Sixteen. Perform uh, appearance in 1990. That was huge. The most fun uh, were the uh, the two wins back to back and back to back years at Loyola Marymount, and then uh, the 115 113 game at the Gardens and in uh, the 1989-90 season when I think uh, Hill had 38, Strong had 31, uh, but Loyola came back. That Bo Kimball hit about nine three pointers in the, in the last. Eight or nine minutes to make that down to the wire. That was, and Hank Gathers, you know, played on on, on those uh, Loyola teams. That, those were incredible. And uh, uh, geez, anytime you beat Bob Huggins, that's a good day. <laughs> <laughs> that is your buddy, Bob Huggins. You know, I, I, I respect that guy. He's, he's a he's the great white shark of college basketball. He'll do anything to win, and I, I you know you know you know what you get with Huggins. He's going to do anything to win, and when he when he does lose, he's like the world's worst loser. And 
I'll never forget the, the no handshake game in, in 94 when Xavier came back to tie it and then won it <laughs> overtime. And Hugs was just livid. And so was Gillen. Gillen, you know, he went over to shake hands with a guy. Hey, come on, game's over, Hugs. Right. And Hugs just blew, blew him right off. <laughs> Gillen, Gillen walked off and slapped the table right in front of us and it, it reverberated. It put the UC uh, broadcasters off the air. <laughs> <laughs> he, well, he and Mark Wagner both slapped the table at the same <laughs> and put the UC broadcasters off the air, but uh, Gillen was red as a beet. I've never seen the, uh, that Irishman that that angry in my life. He was so livid. I know you've gone round and round with Huggins. What's the best Huggins story you've got? I know you've got some good ones from him. Uh, I can't. I can't tell any of those. Man. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Jeez. Look at look at. I don't. I do remember the uh, the, the uh, nineteen ninety shootout, which was Huggy's first year, and he did a a marvelous job with that uh, with that team. I mean, he didn't. He had Steve Sanders, who was a walk on football wide receiver, one of his starters, who was a good basketball player, but he was a football scholarship guy, and then he had Lavertis Robinson and uh, Lou Banks and, and that group. But then there were some talented players, but he had no depth. And they came into the gardens, and uh, you know, Xavier was pretty good that year. Really good. And uh, they had like a six-point lead with uh, less than 90 seconds left in overtime. And then Xavier came back to beat them 90-88. And uh, uh, late, you know, I thought Saber was going to lose. To be honest, we were on the air. Joe and I were talking away. I was a little bitter, and I made some kind of comment about uh, UC's recruiting or uh, lack of ethics or something. So uh, Huggins and Rick Taylor the next day called my program director and said, "Listen, we want Andy Mack to report up to our office and bring copies <laughs> of the broadcast. We need to discuss this." And I said, that, you know, "He doesn't pay my salary. Send him all the copies he wants. I'm not going up there." On his turf and get get bitched out after after this win. We're, we're having too much fun enjoying it. <laughs> awesome. That they is... want they want me to come up there and get beat up on on their turf. No way. No way. <laughs> and then Rick, Rick Taylor called Mike McConnell's show uh, the morning after, and they were they were all upset about that uh, the out of bounds call, which now apparently uh, it was a bad call. I mean, Michael Davenport was involved in it, and from the Zay your side and he says yeah it was uh, it went off me you know <laughs> but, but hey the call was made so rick taylor calls up crying like a baby about the officiating or whatever so it sounds like something i would have done I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh man but that was when the rivalry was i mean that was from 90 huggins first year through 94 <clears throat> until pete left uh and then you know things calmed down because skip and 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 hugs had their kumbaya moment or something but uh, skip would get his players so wound up for that shootout i mean you know no matter what he said publicly about he and huggy being you know having west virginia roots or whatever the hell it was uh, uh skip it was uh, you know the muskies against the world when it came to that shootout and that that game in 97 when lenny brown hit that shot yep. you, that was that was unbelievable because you see he had control of the game they had the lead and the ball with uh, less than 10 seconds left. And that Charles Williams, uh, the, the JUCO uh, recruit right in front of me, uh, dribbled the ball off his foot, and my engineer caught it. I, 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 what a gift. What a gift. <laughs> and, then, and then they inbound the ball to Lenny, and he hits that little floater below the line, uh, the free throw line, and that was uh, that was a beautiful. Uh, my son had given me the uh, <clears throat> the line the night before. He was a freshman at Xavier. We're talking on the phone. He goes, you know, you know, Dad, uh, you and me and Skip and the players are about the only ones who think that Xavier even deserves to take the trip over there tomorrow. Uh, I think you need to prepare something special uh, when when uh, they do beat them. And I go, oh, well, what do you think? And he said, oh, you know, he, he gave me the line. So I, st- I stowed it away and I used it. So there it is. That All these years we've been talking about that line and that's how it was formed right there the night before the game by your son. 
Yep, so really, you don't deserve any of the credit. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. I'm not very. I'm not a very original person. He was. He was having a few beers with uh, his uh, his uh, soccer buddies uh, from the Xavier soccer team, Steve Stamper, and those guys, and they came up with the. Uh, they came up with the line. And that's usually when most of my good ideas come to is when I'm sharing a sharing a beverage. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, uh, finally, be, be, before I let you go. Looking back, all the Xavier teams, all the players you've seen, if you had to pick one out, who do, who would Andy Mack right now pay to go watch play one more time at Xavier? Uh, there, I guess there'd be yeah, there'd be a lot, but uh, the two that I can think of off the cuff, uh, first of all, Byron Larkin who was, uh, uh, how that guy didn't play in the NBA. I can never figure out what the NBA is looking for, but there's a guy who just had a phenomenal career. And he was, a, if there was a watershed player for uh, the Xavier program, it was Byron. I mean, Bob Stack did a great job of recruiting him. And uh, I don't think Mrs. Mrs. Larkin was really keen on Bob, but they, they got over that. And then uh, Gillen did a great job of, of uh, keeping Byron in the fold. Uh, after Stack left, there was a good chance that uh, well, Syracuse wanted him badly. And Wayne Morgan, uh, Bob's uh, top recruiter, was an assistant under Bayheim at Syracuse, and they they did their uh, their damnedest to uh, to get him to transfer. But he he stuck with it and stayed at home, and uh, you know, just a fabulous career. Uh, I'll never forget the game. Uh, I guess it was his junior year. He scored 45 against Loyola over at the old. Market Square Arena in Indianapolis in the MCC tournament. He could not. He was 17 for 20 from the field. Just, uh, you know, un- unbelievable talent, great scorer. Um, you know, I mean, they, all, all the big boys in the NCAA tried to stop him. Nobody could. And my other, my all time favorite musky all court player is Justin Cage. There's a guy who, talk about a team player who, just contributed any way he could, gave you the same <laughs> the same high level effort every every night, you know, uh, weekdays, weekends, holidays, whatever. And then at the at the end of his career, uh, you know, he he's he's the, the magic ingredient against Ohio State and has that big scoring game. And then, you know, uh, he should have been shooting two free throws guaranteed at the end. That the stupid John Call missed the intentional foul call. And, then they make Cage the goat because he misses the second free throw or whatever it was. Right, despite so, the fact that he just got shoved into the third row. Yeah, it just you know deposited into the basket support. Our, our good friend uh, Jay Billis said it was a dive, and uh, you know I got you know that distortion of reality there. Cage, Cage was the strongest guy from the waist down of, of any Xavier basketball player ever. I mean that guy was a weight room fanatic, and uh, what the and Greg Oden's admitted it since then. He said, I, "Hey, in my career, I knew I was going to the NBA. That was my fifth foul. The game was." Over, I, I was going to get my pound of flesh. Yeah, and I just I threw the guy into the basket support. Yeah, it was a complete 200, frustration. Two hundred twenty-five pound guy who came down in a, in a wide stance, uh, cradling the basketball. And that guy, that call guy, had to overrule you know be Mister uh, Mister Important and make the call from way out top where the other guy had the call. I mean, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Andy Mack, unbelievable. It was a stuff. great moment. It was a great moment, nonetheless. Unbelievable stuff. Hopefully, we can convince you to come on and join the podcast again. I really enjoyed it. Hey, if I don't uh, ruin your ratings or whatever, I'd be glad to. <laughs> All right, Andy Mack, everybody. <laughs> All right, it's a pleasure to be joined by Shannon Russell, the Xavier beat writer for the Cincinnati Enquirer, first timer on the Dana Victory podcast. That's pretty big time. Yeah, and sitting as far from us as she possibly can. Right? Well, Tom Iser <laughs> is supposed to be in between us right here, and Shannon, after you got done changing your wife's tire, didn't want to smell your manly stench. By, by so the that's way, why she's down there. Just, just to be clear, that's not a euphemism. I was actually changing, changing your tire. wife's tire. <laughs> um, Shannon, you are. Newly returned from New York, where you attended Big East Media Days, I guess last week, right? Yes. And uh, can you tell us a little bit? Tell us a little bit about that experience. Tell us a little bit about that trip. Well, it was a, a pretty quick trip. 
for me, just going in Tuesday, coming back Wednesday. But I know that on Tuesday night, the coaches all got together and talked to Val Ackerman, the commissioner, uh, talked about what was going to play out uh, the next day and just um, kind of just a show of confidence that she had in, in them while the guys kind of did what they wanted to do. And I know that Samaje and Isaiah, who came with um, Chris Mack, they were able to walk around New York a little bit. And um, they were a little overwhelmed by all the people that were out there, but they had a good time. And then uh, the day of the um, Wednesday, the media day, they just, um, you know, were at a table and we all got to talk to them and we talked about the season and some expectations and Samaji obviously making the first team for the preseason um, all conference. So um, there was a lot to talk about and they did a great job and uh, it was a pretty short day. Obviously, this is the first one of those for this Big East, new Big East, whatever it is. It, did you notice any difference? Was it more unorganized or more organized or was there any difference from the A-10 days really in your opinion? No, not really. It was all the, kind of the same where they just have a, a table for each team. Half the teams go to TV right away and half stay and talk to print media and they switch. Um, but I would say that I felt like there's a lot more media there for the men's portion of it than there was for the A-10. So that was a little different. Well, that's, that, that's interesting too because one of the things we've been talking about at practices and I know Tom Iser has been telling us a little bit is he's not sure what to expect with will people more people come cover these because they're Big East games um, just from a day-to-day -day at the Cintas Center. So that'll be interesting to see how that kind of plays out there as well. Shannon, uh, one of the things that came out during media days was the preseason poll, which is always uh, uh, highly, highly anticipated and talked about quite a bit. And uh, obviously, I think it was pretty clear who the top few teams in the in the league were going to be Marquette Creighton Georgetown but Xavier came in at seventh in the poll was that a surprise to you did you think they were underrated compared to where you expect them to be in the Big East this year I think they were placed where people thought they would be obviously um, but based on last year that's probably a good starting point for them I think they're going to be better than seven I think they have a chance to move up to five and with a really great season maybe even four or three um, what people don't know is they're there's all these new pieces and they don't know how they're going to work together. But I mean, Rick and I have seen practices and we can see kind of how things are starting to shape up and there's just a lot of good chemistry and a ton of talent. So if they can put it all together, they can definitely move up on that scale. Yeah, well, right. Because I mean, the, per, the Creighton beat writer from the Omaha World Herald or whatever probably has no real clue about what Xavier's got coming right. back. So right. a lot more moving pieces for this team than maybe some of the other conference teams. Yeah, plus, I think there's a lot of unknowns when it comes to guys like Matt Stainbrook. I don't a lot of people see a transfer from Western Michigan. I don't think they exactly say, oh, yeah, he's going to be a big time force for them and really change their post presence. When in reality, from what we've seen, it seems like that'll definitely be the case and it'll be a huge addition for this team. Right. And even the freshmen. I mean, no one knows anything about them, but there's a lot of talent coming in there. And then, you know, from, um, like you said, Matt coming in, having practiced with the team all last year. I mean, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot there that people don't know about. So. And, and it's rightfully so. Like people no, yeah. not, shouldn't necessarily know these things, but we have the benefit of obviously seeing them. So we can project maybe a little bit better. One of the things I was going to ask you about, you know, we've talked about this in practice, but leadership is such a big thing. Mac is going to tell us for the next month or so that we rely on our seniors. We rely on our leaders. In your opinion, I mean, I know we've kind of talked about this already, so we kind of probably have the same opinion here, but who's kind of emerging and what have you noticed about the leadership of this team? Oh, it's it's so much better than last year, first of all, but um, Isaiah Fillmore has definitely stepped into that role and um, I think, you know, it started last year, the last half of last year and things were kind of just a disaster there for a while, so um, he became more vocal finally and that's really carried over. He said he wanted to be more vocal this year and he has been. He's showing the freshman where to go. He's not afraid to, like, you know, cut up a little bit and you know make let, lighten the mood a little bit but he's really been vocal and I know that two other guys want to be vocal and that's Samaj Kristen and D Davis they both said they were going to be more vocal this year but I haven't yet seen that yet and I think they're more naturally not the extroverted types so I don't know if that will come to fruition yeah and, and one of the things you know you kind of talk about I know a lot of people felt like there need to be more of uh, th this goes with the Reds too everyone always feels like there needs to be that enforcer role that that yeah. guy who's kind of the bad guy on the team that that tells everyone what to do I don't know that they necessarily have that or need that, but I think Matt Stainbrook is probably the closest to that role where it seems like he's kind of business-like when he's on the court. Even though he's very goofy when he's not on the court, right. he can be very business-like on the court and kind of gets quick to get frustrated when guys aren't 
keeping up or, or guys don't know what they're doing. So I think we might see him develop in that role more as the season goes along. I totally agree. I mean, he's so smart. He knows exactly where he, he needs to be, and he knows where everyone else should be too, like you're saying. So that's going to be a huge asset for them. And, you know, at one of the practices already, there's, there are all these newcomers. I mean, you know, Miles and Jalen and um, Kamal and Brandon and, you know, even Remy coming here and practicing and stuff. I mean, there's it's not going at the pace as it was at the end of last year, of course. Um, but I know some of the upper class were a little frustrated. And even Chris Mack was kind of like, well, we got, you know, you guys, we have some freshmen here. We have to s- slow things down and take it, you know, have a little patience. So they're ready to go. I, w- I want to go back to Isaiah real quick yeah. um, because you mentioned how he just seems different and, and closer to what he was maybe at the end of last year. In my opinion, last year, for a lot of the season, he just seemed like he was constantly struggling. And I don't mean that and he couldn't, he wasn't playing basketball well. It just seemed like maybe he was working to get himself back in shape at first because of the injuries before the season. And then it was, he kind of lost confidence. He lost some minutes and he was battling maybe mentally a little bit with his role on the team. And he just seemed to never really get going until those final weeks. And we saw, hey, he's maybe a double-double type of player Mm -hmm. on a nightly basis when he's right. He's looked nothing but right in the preseason to me. Yeah, and he's talked about losing weight. And I don't know if he's lost 20 25 pounds, like you yeah, said. It doesn't really look like no. it, but he definitely looks better. Definitely, yeah. And he said he's moving better, he feels better, and that plus his confidence and knowing that this is kind of it for him. This is his team, this is his year. I think that's like all motivated. And plus, you know, the end of last year, you know, him missing that final shot. And of course, there was more things in that game that happened to lead up to that. But I think that still stings and gives him some motivation this year. Shannon, when you, you talked about last year, obviously you've been the Xavier beat writer for a number of seasons. Last season was a completely different experience. I think for everybody associated with the program because it was a team that really struggled and scuffled from what mid-November really until the end of the season what did you as you watched that last year what were the things that you saw that were different from the previous successful Xavier teams and how do you think those things will be different this year if they will be well there was really no depth and that's not normal and there was all those reasons that it it happened that it played out that way but I mean guys got tired and there was no one to really relieve them and I think that's obviously why Landon Amos was able to play such a big role and um, come in and give the team a boost but there also wasn't necessarily the leadership last year you had some seniors that were great guys but weren't necessarily wanting to take the reins and tell people what to do or kind of be the enforcer as you're saying so I think that's all different this year because there are a lot of people that want to step up and make sure that that doesn't happen again and I think there's also more depth this year which will be great for the team you know if they want to run they can run now you know there's people that don't have to be playing every minute of the game well I think too one of the things with the depth that we've definitely seen early on in practice is just it's raised the competition level to it's just completely different in here last year it felt like Samaj AD they had to be on the same team because you're going to play them together but there was no one else that could really challenge them as far as defending them or handling the ball against them whereas now there's a guy in Miles Davis and Brandon Randolph who are going to take D. Day- Davis's minutes if he doesn't play well. I right. mean, Samaj is obviously good enough. That's not going to happen. But like these guys have competition practice now and have guys that think they're on the same level. Whereas last year, that just wasn't the case. Right. And it's great, though. It's I mean, obviously it makes for better com- competition. And um, it, these guys have got someone on their heels at all times. So they're trying to play as, as well as they can because, you know, in practice, that's where you really earn your minutes. All right, Shannon, let's get in your head a little bit. Other than the Bahamas this year. What road trip in the Big East are you looking the most forward to, whether it be city, you know, uh, basketball atmosphere, et cetera? I'm looking forward to Chicago style pizza, if I must say. So, like, <laughs> I'm about that life. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. I just uh, finished booking all my travel. And so you're just happy not to be going to <laughs> Ole in New York yeah, anymore. I'm not gonna lie, you're no. going to miss those Fordham games, aren't you, <laughs> Shannon? Uh, yeah, th- I- I'm glad for the changes <laughs> in the schedule. Um, there's a lot of places I'm looking forward to Madison Square Garden, of course, but I've never been to Creighton. That'll be interesting. Um, I, I think that's, you know, I've never been to Georgetown. Of course, we've been to D.C., mm-hmm. so that's um, that's a that's a fun road trip. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm looking forward to all of them. I know it's a horrible answer, but um, there's a lot of new stuff this year. It's nice to change it up. So Ch- Shannon's completely copping out on her first time <laughs> on the podcast. The easiest question we give her. No, I'm just kidding. Um, who's the best road travel partner? 
you got you you you're with all these uh, you're with the team you're with all these other media members on a regular basis when you travel who's who's the person that's cool to hang out with on these trips or go out to dinner with from Xavier yeah just the Xavier group whether it be media members or oh well I, you know Byron and Joe that's what that's best. what I would assume <laughs> yeah. yeah I mean they're the best you can get them if you can get Steve Wolf at a table with you at a restaurant you're gonna be listening to stories all night and just cracking up so. see you copped out on the first one so I figured I'd go a little <laughs> bit easier like there's that's a no-brainer question you can't exactly. answer anything other than Byron and Joe I don't think <laughs> yeah they're they're good there are lots of stories there Shannon as far as the beat writing process um, I don't I think a lot of people you there's a lot of Twitter frustration there's a lot of new things with that role of being a beat writer that I think makes it tougher now than it was maybe even five to ten years ago um, do you agree with that and can you just talk a little bit about dealing with all the social media stuff and how that's kind of changed your role because some of the stuff I mean I get it too but not on near on the level that you guys get it constantly yeah I, I mean Twitter everyone can self-report now I mean here tonight at Musketeer Madness I mean tons of people will be tweeting the same things I do so there's an audience for everyone now so it's just it's different um also video is a big thing we're doing now so i'll be getting out my iphone and taking some video um but it's just it's the way that journalism has changed it's kind of mind-boggling since i got into it um you know i've been at the paper for 12 years and i can't even tell you how different it is now compared to then i mean there was no twitter when i started there was no social media so you're constantly watching social media to see to make sure you know what if something happens sometimes people <laughs> know before you right. and you see it from them i mean you obviously want to be the the source for this news but you know, so many people have access to it, and it, it kind of it, it's still in culture. Obviously, I know, I know people probably enjoyed at the beginning of games last year when they would get the tweet from Rick, the one from me, and the one from you about whatever bow tie Matt was wearing <laughs> within about forty <laughs> seconds. It's hard hitting journalism, well, I, right there. I, I, that's what I like to be on Twitter. I like to be hard hitting journalist uh, guy on Twitter at all times. So I report things like bow tie wearing. <laughs> um, but one, I, I do want to ask you a little bit about that. Do, do you find yourself changing? how you try to report on a team a little bit. Whereas I felt like when I first started doing this, and this is only six years ago, I felt like I wanted to report everything. I wanted to be the one to break it. Now I feel like regardless of whether I break it or not, everyone's going to report it themselves and act like they were the ones to get it within 30 seconds on Twitter. They've got feeds set up in their tweet deck to alert them as soon as it comes off. Their f computer goes off, and literally 30 seconds later, they've got it, and they were mm -hmm. the ones, per a source, they reported it. So I find myself more, I don't really care if I'm the first to break it. I care more about being on top of the story and having the best content ready to go. Have you seen that? Do you feel that yeah, change at all, too? Absolutely. Like I don't want to just tweet for the sake of tweeting, and like you're saying so much, that stuff is just common knowledge because 10,000 people are here watching. Um, but I think for more, for me, I like to do more, not necessarily even just the tweeting, but just doing stories that you aren't going to find. I mean, someone that, you know, wouldn't necessarily know unless they were here all the time and got to know these players. I mean, that's, to me, the best part about the beat. Right. An example of that, an example of that would be your feature about Landon Amos last mm -hmm. week. Um, and you do those year-round, even though, even even outside of Xavier basketball. Your byline will pop up every once in a while for a, uh, for a longer feature. And, uh, and I think, I, I certainly appreciate those articles, but yeah, I mean, one of the things that one of the things that I don't think people may realize is that you operate under even more constraints than Rick does in terms of, you know, your mainstream media. You have to, you have to get sources on the record, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, do you do you get frustrated with the fact that sometimes you have stories and you 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 can get them out there, but you but you can't. You have to hold it back until you can get past the the obstacles that 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 sort of constrain you, I guess? Uh, sometimes, but I just, I'd rather be right than be first. Sure. I mean, that's the most important thing to me. So if I have to sit on it and everyone's tweeting me and saying, why don't you have this? You know, you're horrible. <laughs> you don't do anything. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, knew, I do know what's going on. I just can't just be, you know, guns blazing, just just right for the right. record, I've seen Shannon at practice. I can attest to the fact that she does work occasionally. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I, I always think that's hilarious, though. Just the the, the group think, I guess, the mentality that goes on with Twitter of, like, you don't know what you're doing because you didn't tweet this out yet. It's like, or I was confirming it and getting it right because Joe from uh, Avondale didn't actually have to check a source or no one cared if he was wrong. Right, right. Because, exactly. Because Joe from Avondale probably isn't getting a, a libel suit filed, in, <laughs> filed down the court common pleas the next day so uh well shannon we really appreciate you coming on the show uh taking some carving some time out of your day because i know you've got articles to write about tonight's uh 
festivities. Well, who, we haven't started yet. Obviously, this is being recorded before, yeah. like all of our members know. Mm -hmm. What's your prediction for? I'm not even going to ask the dunk contest. That'd be ridiculous. But do, can I just answer it anyway? You know, it's ridiculous. Sure. Yeah. Jalen. Okay. Um, do Do you think they'll actually have other people dunk against him, or do you think it'll just be three rounds of Jalen dunking against himself, trying to top his score? Probably that, yeah. That would be my vote. I would <laughs> rather just see him try to get the best score. Like maybe he could put on a like a costume, and and have like an alter ego. I would be surprised if we don't see some form of Superman stuff from him. He's a big, he's a Dwight Howard disciple, uh, I, I think. So, so I, I see some Superman stuff coming. But three point contest, who do you got? This is gonna be a tough one. Okay, so the people that are in the three point contest are Justin Martin. Um, I'm already forgetting the other ones. Miles, Miles Dave, Davis, Samaj Kristen, James Farr. James Farr. No, Samaj is in the uh, dunk contest. You're right. I'm okay. sorry. James so Farr is in the three-point contest. Miles. I'm sorry. I'm. <laughs> <laughs> you, you tweeted it, so I'm just going to go ahead and, and check there. It is James Farr, Remy Abel, Miles Davis, and Justin Martin. Um, I think it's going to come down to uh, Miles Davis or Justin Martin, and I think that it's going to be Miles Davis. Wow, going with the freshman. I Dan, know. any thoughts on that? I mean, unless they get unless like they get Redford out there in some sort of in some sort of get up, maybe he could come out in like a Batman costume or something like that. <laughs> what yeah, is, what think, is your deal? It's Halloween and you just want everyone to dress I, I up for Night Night Madness or what? Absolutely. I think it uh, I think it would spice things up a little bit. <laughs> so so you've got who? You oh, still haven't made a pick. Uh, you're asking me? Yeah. Miles Davis. Oh, okay. Wow. What Two votes for Miles Davis. I mean, honestly, I thought I was going to be the one going off the reservation by picking Miles Davis. <laughs> so now I feel like I'm probably rolling with Justin Martin. I kind of agree with you. I'm surprised you picked J-Mart to be in the finals, too. You took the two guys I was thinking of going with, and I didn't think you would say either one of them. Um, James Farr, obviously, kind of a surprise that he made it. Pretty interesting. Yeah, no, that is really interesting. But I mean, we know he can shoot, obviously, right. but three-point contest is... I, I, I would nef wouldn't necessarily assume that. Right. I, I wouldn't either. I'm, I'm very surprised. So. But the other guys, I'm not. So. Yeah, I agree. All right. Well, it'll be a great contest. As Dan said, Shannon, we really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. I you appreciate can, it. And just to plug, you obviously can read Shannon at the Cincinnati Enquirer and follow her on Twitter at, at SL Russell. Correct. Thank there you. You. you can yell at her on Twitter. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, Shannon. Thanks. All right, we are joined by Coach Rick Carter here courtside before Musketeer Madness. Coach, appreciate you joining us. Uh, well, what's it been like here your, your few months in Cincinnati? You know, it, it's really been great. It's obviously been a little bit of a whirlwind coming in right before July, trying to get my feet settled to recruiting. And then obviously, you know, we, I think we put out a pretty good 2014 class and then moving on to 15. And then trying to build the relationships with our players as soon as I could. That was probably my biggest thing that I try to do right away. And it went really well. How much of a process is that coming in? It's a whole new group of guys. Obviously, you have a relationship with Coach Mack and things like that, so it's more with the players. What's that like trying to get on the same page as those guys? Is it pretty instant, or does it take a little bit to get to know them? You know, it definitely takes a little bit to get to know them. You know, every guy is kind of different in their own way, which is great. And then spending time with them to get to know them personally, I think, really helps you in the long run. You know, it can't always just be about basketball all the time. you got to get to know their families. you got to get to know what they're about. you got to get to know their likes and dislikes, and that really helps you coach them. For me, it's been great, obviously. I had to go through it last year at Missouri nine months ago. So I'm a little bit familiar with it. It's not an unfamiliar process, and I'm comfortable doing it. Really, it's helped me. They all know Brad Redford, and obviously I coach Brad Redford in AAU. I worked him out through high school. So I kind of had an instant in with those guys because they know him and they know me from him. Sure. Uh, coach, one of the other, you also had a pre-existing relationship with another guy on the team this year, Matt Stainbrook. Can you talk a little bit about that, how basketball sort of has these weird, uh, the, the road sort of deviates and then it comes back together? Yeah, you know, I had, obviously I coached Matt at Western Michigan as an assistant coach and you know, things didn't go great there for him, him moving on, you know, transferring, but he was a phenomenal player there. You know, he was a guy that could score a lot of points. He really rebounded the ball well. And uh, then moving to Xavier and then me coming here is really exciting. Matt's really, really talented. I think Matt has grown up a lot through the process. And that, I think it was a good thing for him to transfer. And I think coming here, having a fresh start with a new coaching staff, a new fan base is really good for him. We've heard about his new mentality, his new approach to everything. You were with him before when it was the other way. 
What what changed in your opinion? What's different about him now? You know, I think the biggest thing for Matt is there's been a line drawn of what's expected of him. And I, I would be the first one to say that I don't think we did a great job with Matt at Western Michigan doing that. He um, was brought in and we had the intentions of redshirting him that year. And then we were forced to play him due to a transfer situation. And I really don't know if he was emotionally ready for that at Western Michigan. I think he was really looking forward to being a guy that was going to sit out a year lose a little bit of weight and work on his skills and then when he got forced into that I think it kind of he kind of got upset by that I think over the long haul and here he's been unbelievable emotionally he's been really really stable he's been a force in practice he's been great <laughs> coach Mac uh, coach Mac you want to join the podcast no you want to I want I want to hear what BS this guy's spewing right now well, <laughs> all true well coach Carter what type of what type of boss is coach Mac like to work for you know me and him were actually recruiting the last two days together <laughs> and, I'm sorry uh, to hear that yeah he, he said the same thing about me he's like I'm sorry to hear that <laughs> but, yeah he actually did tell me that no but the one thing that I told him for me this has probably been the easiest job that I've had because my relationship with him is prior and like holding our guys accountable to his rules are really easy because he's my friend and I don't really want to let him down and first and foremost we have a friendship so it's really been easy to learn his standards because I've known him in the past we spent a lot of time together on the road recruiting so I kind of know what he's looking for and it's been really really easy. You mentioned recruiting there obviously one of the things the fans are always looking at is what type of territories are we getting into where where do you feel comfortable recruiting and where do you think you can kind of help this program? Well, obviously, when I was at Western Michigan, I recruited Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, and Illinois a lot. Um, my AAU ties really tie me into those places as well, too, being the former coach of the Michigan Mustangs. And then being out at Fairfield, I got to know all the prep school coaches a ton, and I'm really comfortable out in the prep schools. I think the thing that's really elevated me recruiting more than anything is my last job at Missouri. Um, Frank Haith put a ton of stock in recruiting, obviously. He was known as a great recruiter as an assistant coach himself at Texas, and he really taught me that I had to be a national recruiter you know I had I recruited Brandon Randolph from Missouri who ended up coming to Xavier obviously right. I didn't do that good of a job but good work know. on that one by yeah. the way the fans are saying it though yeah no question no question but so I'm comfortable in California I'm comfortable in Texas you know Kansas City I think is a place that we kind of got to explore into obviously we've had some luck in Minnesota as of late you know I think Minnesota is a great place you can get into due to the fact that there's only one Division One University. And there's surprisingly right, right, right. a lot of talent in Minnesota, believe it or not. There, you know, I think it's always a place that's really recruited nationally, mm-hmm. but um, there's a ton. You know, Minneapolis turns out a lot of yeah. good players. Right. And Coach, I know that uh, you, you mentioned um, uh, your ties in Western Michigan. You're from, I believe, the Flint area, right? I am, yes. And so, you, so you're obviously very another great hotbed for high school and prep basketball, the Detroit, Detroit and Flint and, and so forth. What to you is the most – we've talked to Travis Steele on this podcast, and we sort of tried to pick his brain a little bit about the recruiting process, and he told us a little bit about his mentality. What's your philosophy? How do you identify targets, and then how do you develop that relationship going through the process? You know, I think the number one thing you have to do is you have to have a connection to an area. So, like, obviously for me, being the former coach of the Michigan Mustangs, I rely on my contacts there a ton to tell me who's good, who's playing well. And you're obviously always reaching out to, you know, the scout.com people, rival.com, just to find out. Mainly just scout, though. Mainly just scout. Mainly just scout. (laughs) Right. Sorry about that. But all those guys who, uh, you know, watch guys all the time. And then you go in there and you really, I firmly believe that you have to be honest with kids. I think if you're honest with kids and you form a genuine relationship with them, it's going to pay dividends in the long haul. And the fact that we do recruit three classes out here gives you time to really build a core relationship, not just with a kid, but with his, you know, champions in the process. All right, Coach Carter, we really appreciate you spending this time with us. Before we let you go, we're just a few minutes, well, about 30 minutes now away from the the beginning of this event who do you got in the dunk contest and three-point contest in the three-point contest i'm gonna go with miles i, I think miles wow that's davis, four picks for miles davis yeah, right now i think he's gonna be a hard guy to beat i really do especially in you know a three-point shootout that's kind of his deal I'm going to go with the dark horse here in the slam dunk contest. Whoa. I'm going to go with Brandon Randall. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go with the little guy. You know, Jalen obviously has the hops. You know, Maj obviously is going to be a crowd favorite, but Brandon's a little bit smaller. I think he's going to be an impressed guy. Well, those those dunks look better when it's a shorter guy dunking. It's like the Spud Webb syndrome, no right? No question. It just yeah. depends. I don't, you know, I don't know who the judges are. I think when we find out who the judges are, that'll help. As long as it's not Dante Jackson. Yeah, I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. No, he, he should judge the three-point shootout. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Coach. Thanks a lot for spending time with us. I appreciate it, guys. 
All right. Well, Our, we've got speaking a, of which. Yeah, I was going to say we've got another guest coming on. So that this is probably the right time to do that. We're going to talk to my guy, Richard Skinner. You can see him on Sunday nights on the Sports Authority with me occasionally. And uh, he also writes for the Enquirer covering Northern Kentucky high school sports. Richard Skinner is our second guest of the night. Skinny, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you guys doing? I uh, couldn't be better, man. Well, uh, well, Skinny, first of all, we wanted to get your thoughts. We had Brad Redford on earlier in the show. You've gotten a chance to, to get to know Brad a little bit, see him in front of camera. How's he doing as a TV guy so far? He keeps getting a little bit better each and every week and getting a little more comfortable with it. Um, he actually, last year, I was I was anchoring uh, for a week or so over, over Christmas break, and Brad actually was interning at the time. I think in the summer before, right, right when he had his knee surgery. Um, so I got to know Brad a little bit then. He was in some some as an intern, but I'm happy for him. The only thing he's got wrong so far is he somehow had SMU located in Houston, Texas. What he actually is in the Dallas, Fort Worth area. But other than that, he's done quite well. Well, they have theology at Xavier, so it kind of substitutes out with geography at times. It's weird how the scheduling works, I believe, for uh, Xavier basketball exactly. players. Um, Skinny, I do have to ask you, in a game of one-on-one between me and Redford, who do you got? Um, you know, it, it would be like watching two turtles try to play defense against each other. Right, I'm thinking 198. It's a toss-up, right? (laughs) The thing is, he he can go out to 30 feet probably and knock him down. He can just keep taking a step further back, further back. I'm not sure you can keep doing that yourself. Is there something wrong with 25-footers? I can go 25 feet, Skinny. Yeah, but I I, I think you at least get a hand out on you at 25. (laughs) And you ain't taking him to the rack either, my friend. That's that's right. I feel like there might be a little conditioning gap here, but go on. Go on. All right. If if, if my lateral quickness is in question, then I, you guys just don't know basketball clearly. Well, and, and you got to wonder. I mean, God love me, he did play last year with, with after having a knee surgery. But how, how's the knee feel for him? That's, well, that's and he's had an ankle injury that. since then. He's getting yeah. up there too. He, yeah, he, he's all of what twenty three years old. He's an old man. Right, right, exactly. It, nothing good happens after 22. I know that uh, as well as anybody. Skinny, the reason we had you on, one of the main reasons, we uh, tonight's one of the question nights here on the Dan and Victory podcast where we take a lot of submissions from the fans. And one of the ones I got on Twitter was uh, they wanted clarification from you about something you said two weekends ago when we were on Sports Authority. I've got the audio here. We'll listen to the clip. I think I know what you meant. I think I know why fans are kind of curious by what you meant. Um, uh, we'll get your thoughts on it here. Uh, let's listen to the audio. I think X is poised to make potentially the deepest run of anybody in the Tri-State. Do you still feel that way about them? They'll bounce back? And I, I do because, again, everybody talks about defense and defense in the NCAA. The NCAA tournament's about scoring. Who scores the best? Right. And Xavier, to me, scores better than UC. Now, that being said, UC's probably still going to go in as a three or four seed, so they're going to still have a favorable matchup for the first couple of rounds. Mick has done such a good, good job to maximize that talent. I just don't know how much they can score when the game's on the line against good competition. Well, we saw it last all right, Skinny, there you have it. So I think, obviously, some of the Xavier fans are going to wonder, well, when they struggle, they struggle to score. But I'm assuming you're talking about all things being equal, everybody being at their best. Xavier has some pieces that those other teams in the Tri-State just don't have. Well, if you think about this, there, there are times, and plenty of times, and this isn't going to be your best defensive team on the floor, but Xavier can put a team on the floor where you, you can score from all five positions. And, and in the NCAA tournament, again, when people talk about defense, uh, really, it is teams that can score and maximize offensive ability. Yeah, I know X has struggled at times, but look when, when they struggle primarily, right? I mean, they, they struggle against Villanova. They, 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 they laid an egg there on the road. But you look at most of their, most of their games when they play, play well, they put the ball in the basket. Now, they've had some issues stopping some good teams, but, but for the most part, to me, you can put guys on the floor that, that you have to defend at all five spots. You have to defend the five. You put four in the game occasionally before, you got to defend the four. I mean, you, you, got, you got enough wing shooters, you got to defend the two and the three. You, you've just got a, a, a tough matchup across the board. Is X flawless? Of course not. They wouldn't be 18 and 8 if they didn't have some flaws, for goodness sakes. But, but to me, if you ask which team has the potential for the deeper run, I would go X. Now, I will tell you this, I think you'll agree with this. Um, you know, it is a fluid season. You can't take what a team did in November and relate it to today. You can't even take what a team did three or four weeks ago and relate it to today. Today, you see, is, is the better team. But to me, Xavier, if, if I if I want to take a group into a tournament and say, I think this team has a better chance, I'd still take my chances with X. 
Skinny, what do you think X has to do in their last five games? You got road games at Georgetown and St. John's this week, uh, home games against Villanova, Creighton, and then on the road at Seton Hall in some order. How many of those games do you think Xavier has to win to feel very confident of a bid heading to New York City? I think two, and that that's still kind of a stretch because you would say, well, you know, they got two home games left in the two home games. Well, they just happen to be Creighton and Villanova is all. Um, and then the three road games are, 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 you know, two of them, Georgetown and St. John's. Georgetown's playing a little bit better here late. St. John's is playing great here of late, and Seton Hall's already beaten you. You get two of those, it gets you to 20 before you go to New York. I think you've done enough. And the funny part is when you start weighing big wins for Xavier at the end of the day, one of the bigger wins they may have is that, is that win over UC back in December. Yeah, without question, that's going to be something that the tournament committee looks at, and that that win just keeps looking better and better as UC's season continues. Um, it, we, we've talked about it on the podcast multiple times. It's almost surreal to believe that that game happened earlier this year when you look at these teams now. And, and that's why when you really start to look at teams, you know, what they did during the course of the season, it, seasons just change. I mean, Rick, you've coached it. You've seen it. You've been around. You guys have been around enough. Like I said, a team you see in November and you go, wow, they're going to make a deep run in March. Well, by the time maybe conference play rolls around, they have a key injury, a guy doesn't play, you know, doesn't play as well when, when they get in conference play and play gets a little more physical. Teams just are completely different from November and December to what they are today. In fact, I mean, that UC team at the Xavier loss, I, mean, I think there, there were a lot of fans wondering if UC could even make it to the tournament. And then, you know, they turned around and, and played Pitt in that ugly game and got the win. And that really didn't bolster anybody's confidence. You look up and here they sit today, you know, sitting at 20, 23, 24, and Three, so you know what you see at certain times of the season. It, it, it does. It changes your perspective on what they're about. Um, the only I'll tell you about UC, and, and, and I know this is going to come off to sound like a knock, and it, I promise you, it, it, it really and truly isn't. The AAC gives you a chance to catch your breath. The Big East, it's not the Big East of Syracuse and 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 you know pit days, um, but the Big East doesn't really allow you to catch your breath. Yes, you got your breath caught two nights ago or, or last night. Against the pole. That, that, that's about that's the, that's the one breather you can go ooh, in that league. You know, in the AAC, there's a lot of chances to catch your breath at home. A South Florida, a Central Florida, a Houston coming into your place, a Temple. I mean, you got to even on the road with some of those, you know, going to Temple. In years past, that's a tough game. This year, ain't very tough at all. Going to Central Florida, isn't very tough. Um, you know, the, 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 the couple of tough games that UC's played in that league, um, I'll give them credit. They're two and one in their three toughest games in the league, winning at Memphis, um, winning at Louisville, and then getting clobbered by, by SMU. So the, the AAC gives you that chance to kind of go, whoo, and there's a lot of leagues where you just don't have that chance to do it. Yeah, and that, that sort of takes you back to like when you look at the A-10 last year. Uh, well, maybe maybe not. Maybe last year's a bad example, but in years past, Xavier has had those those breathers built into the conference schedule. Sure. When you when you look at, at, at Xavier's performance this year in the Big East, is it better about the same or worse than you expected it to be and how do you think they've handled that transition generally if uh, a buddy of mine is a season ticket holder and I we went to uh, the last game I went to in person was the Wake Forest game it was right before conference play started and we were looking up at the banners and he said give me a guess what do you think and I, I was kind of doing it in my head I said you know 12 and 6 11 and then I, I think I take take that right now and, and run to the bank and 12 and 6 now is, a, is obviously a little far fetched because that means they'd have to go 4 and 1 but to go three and two down the stretch is not inconceivable. Um, you know, if they go two and three, that's that's one win really less than what I thought. The, the game that still I think sticks in everybody's crawl if you're a Xavier fan um, is the Seton Hall game. You know, every other game that you look and you go, okay, I get that. You lose at Marquette, it's not a great Marquette team, but it's still up there. You get that. Um, even losing at Providence, you get that. The one game that stands out where you go, what? was a Seton Hall game because that, that would be one that I, well, as I'm looking up at those banners and trying to count wins in my head, I, I would have never foreseen that game. But other than that, it's kind of played out the way I kind of thought it would play out. Yeah, I, could, I couldn't agree more. When you look at that uh, Seton Hall game, that's the only one that you look at since the trip to Atlantis, which I think a lot of people have kind right. of 
only taken with a grain of salt the USC loss, which was the one bad one they had there. But if you look at the Seton Hall loss, I think that's the one where it's like all these other games were a missed opportunity that you didn't take advantage of. That one yeah. cost you. That one hurts you when it comes down to uh, tournament time and they're filling out the brackets. But but like you said, I mean, you avoid any more bad losses, which they only really have one, and it's not a terrible one. And you would imagine they would go to Seton Hall and, and want revenge. So that it's hard to yeah. fathom them losing that game at this point. There's a great website that I love called bracketmatrix.com. I don't know if you guys ever check it out, but it's it's an aggregator that looks at all the different bracketology websites that are out there and averages them up. So, you know, theoretically, it smooths out the real outliers. And right now, they've got Xavier sort of as a consensus 10 seed. And if you count the number of teams that are sitting between X and the bubble, there's about seven or eight teams that are between Xavier and that cutoff. And when you look at some of the teams that are, that are competing for those last few spots, you're talking about Southern Miss, Richmond, Georgetown, uh, Providence, Tennessee, Oregon, not great teams, not teams with, with great resumes. So I think maybe fans are overestimating what it's going to take to get into the tournament because maybe we're still looking at it with an Atlantic 10 mindset and thinking, man, you know, uh, 11 and 7, 10 and 8, 9 and 9 in the league, that's not going to be good enough. But I think this team is better situated maybe than we, than we, than we think they are primarily based on that one seat in Hall loss. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think the fear is, and, and, and as you talk about looking back at those eight ten days, you know, you could look down the stretch of an eight ten schedule and go, well, that's. A, I mean, honestly, out of the last five games, so there's not a definite win left on Xavier's schedule. Not one game you go, definitely they're going to win that game. There's all five games are, are winnable, certainly, and I think we, everybody would be disappointed. And you'd say, hey, if you went zero and five, you don't deserve to get in anyway, for goodness sakes. And, and they won't if they would were to go zero and five. But I think there's a little fear and trepidation there too, where you could look at an old eight ten schedule and go. Well, that's a definite win, and that's a definite win, and that's a definite win, and that's a 50 50 game, and that's a 50 50 game. These last five games, I mean, there's not one game you go, oh, they're definitely winning that game. They're five right. really tough right. games here down the stretch. I think that puts a little fear, fear of God in you a little bit, too. Yeah, without question. Well, Skinny, the, the basketball talk is great, but I know people miss hearing you on the radio and you're getting your hot sports take. On this podcast, we always have a little potpourri section at the end where we spitball about local sports. So I've got to ask you, Homer Bailey. A uh, hundred and five million for this guy, six years, a mutual option for a seventh. Um, I'm not going to ask you, is he worth it? Because that's a stupid question. I, I agree with what Mo Egger's been saying all week that, look, at, at this point, the market dictates that we can say he's not worth it, but someone was going to pay him that. So in your opinion, looking at what the Reds have already tied up in Joey Votto um, and, and this current situation of their roster and that rotation, the other guys that are coming up, where do you come out on the Homer Bailey deal? I still think you wrap up as much pitching as you can wrap up for as long as you can wrap it up. At the end of the day, the two silly contracts are overpaying for a second baseman. And granted, he's an all-star level second baseman. And quite frankly, the overpaying for your first baseman. That's where you over, that's where you backed yourself into a tough corner. Uh, it, it's just, you, you can argue and say, well, just keep drafting arms and developing arms. Hey, if, if you grew up a Red fan over the last couple of decades, it took them a long time to start to get some homegrown talent to come through here. Um, to me, I wrap up my pitching, and then I, I I figure out a way to develop some offense or go go deal some parts for some offense. Because I just think offense a lot of times is, is is a whole lot easier to find in arms. Um, I'd love to see him be able to wrap up Latos too. And you give me, uh, you know, a, a Latos of bailing. You got Singrani, you know, under your thumb for the next five years, including this year. Um, you know, you even even throw Quato still in the mix a little bit. You, you've got the, the makings of a rotation that's still going to be a very very good one for the next three to five years. Before. And- I think you backed yourself into a real corner with that first base and second base scenario. And you've got, and you also when you talk about the rotation, you've got, uh, you know, Mike Leak is is under team control for a couple right. more years, right. and yeah. Robert Stevenson will be knocking down the door maybe as soon as uh, as this fall. So I, you know, my I, I kind of come out in it the same place same place you do skinny you know for me it's uh i I don't mind overpaying to get real quality and i think Votto is real quality and i think bailey is real quality i think they're top they're top guys at their positions i where i come where i get you know the the where i get a little bit frustrated is when they give premium money or slightly below premium money to guys that aren't really anything special so for me the bigger offenses are the you know the phillips the phillips deal is too long it's too much money the Ludwig 
contract was kind of, I, I think was too long and, and tied up too much money. And the Jonathan yeah. Broxton contract at this point is completely yeah. indefensible. So those are the problems. The problem is not overpaying stars. The problem is paying too much money to mediocre veterans that don't give you that much more than you could get from cost control guys from your own system or from other systems. Well, yeah, and, and, that, 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 that's fair. I, I, I think that that's fair. The, the other part too, when you talk about signing Bailey, Rick is, is and, and so is, um, you know, you talk about the cost control portion of it. Let's say in another three years, Stevenson does come up and pitches well. You've had another prospect come up and pitch well. You suddenly look and go, okay, we've got two young arms ready to plow their way into this rotation. You now set probably in two or three years of homers as good as you think. Um, or even if he, if he continues on the path he's currently on, uh, a guy where you start to look at the market value and go, wow, he's, he's, he's very market value driven. You can then maybe deal a piece like that to go get, get some offense down the road. To me, you probably control the cost on a guy like that. So no, I, I have no problem with the signing whatsoever. I, I'm really interested to see what happens with Bailey going forward and how he progresses because I look at him as a guy who was still getting better last year. I don't think he's yeah. he's reached his potential at all yet, and I still look at it as a guy that if he ends up truly reaching his potential and matching his level of stuff or his ability and talent, he's a guy that could be a 210 type guy like Grinky. And when it's all said and done in two or three more years, if he continues to progress, so I love the Bailey signing, but I'm also interested because it really shocked me. I thought he was a guy who didn't really care for Cincinnati at all, didn't necessarily care for this club and his teammates. I thought he was more than ready to get out of here. Now that he's completely bought in, one would think by signing this deal, what what do we get out of Homer Bailey? Not saying that he hasn't been given it 110%, but I just wonder if there's a different mindset at this point, if there's a little bit more maturity. I think we've seen that over the past couple of years. Does this kind of cement something and really turn that light all the way on for him to where we get the best of Homer Bailey finally? Yeah, and, and, and you would certainly hope so. And, and that's the other part, too. I mean, you, you made the point. He, he has improved each and every year, and you're still getting him on the rise. It, it, this isn't a finished product. If this was a 33-year-old guy that had three or four good years, you may say, okay, he's about to hit that ceiling. I don't think that do we even know what the ceiling is for Homer Bailey. No. I don't think we do. And, and he, you know, it's not like he's gone up and back and then up and sideways. Uh, he's got a chance, if he lowers his ERA and increases his innings pitch, to become just the third pitch. Major League history to do that four years in a row. Think about that for a second. I mean, that, that that's some some rarefied company right there. When you're talking three guys ever to do that, and, and at age 27, going on 28, there's a lot of a lot, lot of innings left in that arm. You would think. Another thing that I like about this signing is that Bailey's a guy that's been in the red system since he was 18, and not only does this show just as the Votto thing did a, a, a loyalty to your own guys and a showing that you can become a star and play your career out in Cincinnati but also when it comes to pitching people always say well injuries are you know injuries are the, the wild card and that's definitely true but doesn't it make a little bit more sense to keep around a guy that you've observed on a day-to-day basis for 10 years and you know sort of his you you, you can track his nutrition you can track his workout habits you 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 see him day to day at the ballpark you see the way he goes about his business I think the fact that the Reds were willing to give this number of years to a guy that's been around for 10 years that they've observed on that micro level demonstrates that he is that they expect him to move to continue moving in the right direction. So, yeah, I mean, well, it's well, been a great point. It's been an off season, you know, of, of where kind of it was sort of a, a some sometimes it felt like the Reds front office was from the movie Weekend at Bernie's. But <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think that they have taken some moves that should shore things up. Um, uh, down the road. All right, real quick, Skinny, I promise, before yeah. we let you go, there was one last question here from the fans that wanted to know a little bit on the uh, Bengals and Reds side. So I'll, I'll kind of modify this question a little bit. They wanted to know if each team's window is closing. I'll ask you, whose, windows, whose window is closing quicker, the Bengals or the Reds, to make the playoffs and make a championship run? And as, as much as we're gushing about the Bailey signing, and rightfully so, I, I, the window to me is closing on the Reds quicker. Um, just because God, you go into this season with just so many question marks at so many different spots and no ready answers if something fails. If Ludwig fails, you don't have a ready answer. If Cozart fails, you don't have a ready answer. If Todd Frazier fails, you don't have a ready answer. If you have an injury, to, 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 I mean, if Billy Hamilton fails, you still really don't have a ready answer. 
there's just a lot of holes on, on that offensive side of it. Now, if everything clicks, you have enough pitching and you would have enough uh, enough stuff to get back to the playoffs again. But to me, the Bengals window still still open for another two or three years, maybe even longer than that. I think they've done just a really good job of, of continuing to, to infuse young talent into what they've already had in the mix. Yeah, that's where that's I, I agree completely. I look at the Bengals with what they've done in their player development side of things and the way they've drafted and brought young talent in on the defensive side of the football. I look at that as as a team that's built to win and, and sustain this player development cycle. They they're not getting great talents necessarily, but they're taking guys that are mid level that fit what they want to do on the defensive side of the football, and they're turning them into solid football players that are interchangeable parts. They had so much depth on the defense this year. You saw multiple huge injuries when you talk about guys like. Leon, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't even have to go through them. We we know all the big injuries they had, and they were still able to survive them and be a very good defense in in a in a tough uh, um, conference. So I, I look at the, the Bengals and, and think that they're still good to go for a couple years. Yes, the quarterback position is a question, and I think people overblow that a little bit. If this team is good enough to win, they'll be good enough with Andy Dalton. They were they weren't quite there yet. They're not quite there yet. But we've seen teams win with worse quarterbacks than Andy Dalton. It can be done, and and I think they'll address it within the. The year, within the next year or two if if he's not the answer so I think the Bengals are fine but yeah I'm, I'm with you on the Reds my thing with the Reds is if they're not good this year if they're not good next where did where do they get better there's no like you said there's no plan in place at any of these spots to where oh this guy doesn't work out Todd Frazier's not the guy at third well who the hell is there's no one behind him ready to take it <laughs> is it Santiago that they signed in the offseason? I mean, honestly, I, I'm not sure that there is. And that's that's the scary part. And, and there's really not a whole lot in the pipeline. Yeah, the rotation, you can look at and say it, it, it's playoff caliber, playoff worthy. The rest of it, oh boy, you are on thin, thin ice and you're crossing your fingers. You don't suffer any kind of an injury or any kind of a player um, not living up to, the, to, to, to what you're hoping. Uh, I mean, if Todd Frazier is what he was last year and Cozart is what he was last year and Billy Hamilton technically is what he was in, in the minors and and Ryan Love would get you 100 games, you're going to be in some trouble. Yeah, no, nah, I'm with you. All right, well, Skinny, appreciate you coming on. Be sure to check him out on Sunday nights on the Sports Authority. Check out his work in the Enquirer. Anything else in the works right now? We miss you on radio, obviously. You got anything else going on? No, nope, just staying busy with the Enquirer, doing a little bit of TV and, uh, and coaching some basketball. There you go. You can find him on the sidelines near you, heckling officials as well. So exactly be, right. sure to, be sure to find that. Skinny, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Hey, guys, I appreciate it. Enjoy it. Thanks very much. We appreciate you listening in to this special edition Dana Victory podcast, only available on musketeerreport.com. For Dan, I'm Rick. Thanks for listening, everyone.